rolling. Hi, Marla. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> the regulars. What's up, everybody? It's another uh, Wednesday night. <laughs> Wednesday night, yeah. Welcome to Sit Rep 2020. We'll be on episode five, eight, four, five, four. I Something. don't know, man. We're yeah. so prepared. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's, uh, so prepared is right. <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's fun because, you know, I think it's, I don't know, if you have a free schedule and then you're like, oh, no, I'm going to start something. Wednesday night works perfect. As soon as you start it, it's like all kinds <laughs> of crap happens and you're like, man, Wednesday's, maybe that wasn't the best night. You know, it's, like, uh, it's just crazy, man, how, how fast the days go. Yeah, that's, that's no kidding. I was trying to get <sighs> as much stuff as because it's my day off. So I was trying to get as much stuff done and accomplished as possible. So. Uh, I still don't feel like I did anything, you know, uh, <laughs> it's like the day goes by so fast. Hi, Marla. Hi, Kevin. It's good to see you guys again. Members of the resistance. So today we're going to be delving into kind of some issues. This is, we talk about like this being a spiritual war and, and dealing with things. I kind of want to break down and go into some details about, um, cause this is kind of what, what the whole sit rep idea is, is kind of, you know, understanding the enemy and understanding their battle plans and how things, you know, happen, how they attack and what kind of tactics they use. So that's kind of what we're going to, we're going to try to expose and talk to a little bit today. And then we have some other kind of random topics to talk about. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, we have, let's see what it, Trump just was signing some stuff about Palestine and Israel, and we've got the coronavirus, and, you know, it's, uh, connection to uh what raccoon city and <laughs> yeah raccoon city and the umbrella corporation yeah uh, what else we got we got uh, the space force is kicking off yeah well yeah. sorry if you're hearing these come through i'm trying to prepare something and i can't figure out how to uh, <laughs> shut off the volume while i'm doing it that's why you need one of these pretty mics it's got a little button on it where you can mute yourself oh dude i just need like a studio man that's all it is <laughs> come on god bless me with the studio and an assistant. So I could be like, cue that up, Johnny. <laughs> Let's cue up number five. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm a, I, if I did have an assistant, I would name him Sean Hannity. <laughs> so that way I could, you know, say, hey, Sean. Sean Hannity's my assistant, you know. And I would never show him. Or I could say Glenn Beck. Name him Glenn Beck. Or name him somebody famous, right? So I could advertise glenn back with you know no one would know they would never would see him. he's always off camera some reason we're having a malfunction over here glenn's camera's not working again this week we had this thing completely rolling last week and now it's now it's messing up again illuminati you know <laughs> they're messing with their signals <laughs> yeah well i think it's the mormons they were mad because i refused to do the 23 and me no man it's test. scientology you yeah, well, it's all for sure. Exposing for Scientology, sure. so that's uh, that's it. I mean, they just they just demonetized our video because I said it. They probably did. <laughs> you know, it's it, well, you know, it's so funny, man. When I so I I don't know if you guys follow me regularly. I'm imagining that the three people that are in the chat room right now <laughs> um, do because I see their names all the time. I put up the uh, 13th episode of Reality Distortion Effect. The second that I posted it, it was banned in New Zealand. Uh, I don't know what that's about, but what was the part that was banned? It was uh, there's a small clip in it that I took from the Brain Initiative, is what it's called, and it's like a Neuralink type situation where there, it's some corporation or group of people that are talking about uh, you know man machine interfacing and all that stuff, but they have their little promo video that talks about the brain initiative and these little microchips that go in you and all that stuff. It's their video. I just added it and uh, it banned, it got my video got banned in New Zealand. So apparently this is going down in New Zealand right now because <laughs> they don't want these people knowing at all what's happening. So, yeah, so let all your friends know in New Zealand. Yeah. Anybody in New Zealand, I want to know, I'm going to put this out there because I know all you guys got family in New Zealand in the chat room right now 
if you have somebody that you know in New Zealand, ask them what's banned in New Zealand or banned in America that we can't see, and then we'll know. All right? And no, you don't hear helicopters. I think my fridge or my freezer just kicked on. You might have heard that. <laughs> you got helicopters circling. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, I kind of do. I mean, I don't think you can hear them, though. There's no way. But I live close to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and they have those gigantic C-130s coming through all the time. And they, they there's, we're, like, right outside the circle where they uh, wait to land, you know? They circle around all the time. And uh, many times I've come outside in the middle of the night and been, like, because you feel like this rumble. And you're yeah. like, what in the world is that? And you go outside, and there's three or four of them kind of circling waiting but there's some they're big planes man massive plane i can't imagine how loud they are standing right next to them yeah i know robbie davidson's wife's from new zealand yeah i have to ask him we'll have to have robbie on the show just robbie if you're listening <laughs> we just we, we just want to relay information yeah. to your wife <laughs> oh, yeah yeah she's got contacts we got we get we, we call robbie we're like that. robbie dude can your wife come on the show? He's like, no, but I'm free. And we're like, no, dude. It's no, cool. man. We're, yeah. It's cool, man. Plus, we need somebody with an accent on here anyways, dude, just to make it cooler, you know? Yeah. I'll put we out there. We got that Midwestern, like. The hillbilly, white trash <laughs> voice, radio voice. Like, is this guy. We sound like flyover country. <laughs> hey, Marla, how's that for some some gear? I'm decked out today. Marlo was posting pictures on Facebook of her patchwork. Oh, I Looking saw that. Good. Yeah, yeah. There's my patch. Mine's made on the back of my a giant. Made so. myself a hat. Got the resistance shirt on. If I could, I'd I wear this get resistance shirt today because mine has. It's got that like man. Oh yeah, like Angelo, but it's Darth Vader. Yeah, I, I've literally had people think that that was a pentagram on there from a distance, and I'm or like the the Baphomet, and I'm like, uh, no, it's Darth Vader. I even got red and black <laughs> headphones on. I don't know if you can see that or not, but I don't see you're rocking. I got a red beard, you know. <laughs> my beard used to be darker, but as I just progress deeper into the resistance, it starts to come out of manifest out. The red just manifests out of my body. That's true. Leaching out. <laughs> and I'm right handed. So right now, only my right armpit has red hair growing out of the other one. <laughs> still dark so i just i need to get more ambidextrous with my missions and ministry uh yeah, i mean but yeah wanna... dude i'll tell you what man if you guys if you guys do go to through the black and support them and buy some stuff man tom will hook you up he'll dump a ton of stickers and all kinds of goodies and stuff in your bag anything you can to fill that sucker up for you so it's pretty cool you get all kinds of cool knickknacks i got a bunch of random stickers that I didn't even know existed before. So there's my little push. And if you haven't checked out, go to resistandrescue.com pretty soon. I think, well, this is, might be the last week. It's February next week, right? Yeah. We'll see what happens. I'll, I'll be up to, I'm going to have to stay on top of our boys over there. Did you hear the, uh, the big fat shout out we got on Dis uh, Disputed Lands? No, I did not. Did we get first, a beef? Yeah, from the first couple of minutes of their uh, their video with uh, was it Jamie Walden or? Oh yeah, really? I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I was super busy. I only got the last ten minutes of that show. I, I haven't even gone back to listen. I haven't had time, man. That sucks. I mean, I mean, that's awesome, but I want to hear it. What happened? Who said what? It was. Uh, it was Chad. Chad oh, nice. A big shout out. Yeah. <clears throat> I tag Jamie Walden every time. Man, he would Jamie, be awesome if you're listening. To have on, if you're listening, cause... man. Yeah, heck yeah, he would. If you're listening buddy say what's up in the chat if you ever hear this come stop in and say hi we appreciate you but yeah i was looking at his uh one of his men's retreats that he does it's pretty it's legit man it's like you know warfare camp <laughs> and uh it's like 500 bucks you go play you go you play with guns and do all kinds of manly stuff and camp out and have fellowship it seems pretty cool it's out in the fun. it's out I'm in the big, mountains and stuff you know i'm a big paintballer so that would be awesome I oh just yeah have to convince my uh convince my wife to let me go play in the forest for a couple of days for sure <laughs> well if you ever come visit me man i got forest i can do we can run around just the two of us <laughs> that wouldn't be 
just it wouldn't like, be weird at all, man. Nah, well, not at all. Like we, one person shoots, and it's like, all right, you win. Well, I got. We could, get to, we could go out and. Well, we could bring Tony. Tony with us. We'll get Tony and Chris because they they're not far. We'll go get them. We'll bring them over. We'll play two on two. We'll play uh, the Holy Hand Grenade versus Take on the World TV paintball. <laughs> Full contact, and yeah, it'll be fun. All right, <laughs> that'll be hilarious. So All right, let's. Do you want to you want to start off with prayer or what do we want to do? Yeah, sure, I can do okay. that. Yeah, I can do that. Father, we thank you so much for the uh, another opportunity, another week um, that you blessed us with, with health and safety and provision. And we're glad that we all made it and we can all fellowship again and dig into your word and learn about the promises um, and learn how to take control uh, of our lives to your glory and your benefit. And Jesus, we just we ask that you bless this time that we have together and Keep all the shills out. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, what's up, May Love? Everybody else, thanks for joining us. If you guys do join us, and I'm sure there's more than four people that are commenting in the chat. If you have ability, say what's up in the chat so everybody knows who's, who's watching. Also, uh, give us a thumbs up and share it. We're trying to get a good idea of how many people how many people are actually able to join us at this time of night? So we, we're getting pretty steadily uh, almost 200 views, probably between 150, 200 views a week. Or I mean, total probably, but it's all happening within the first week. So we understand nobody's, you know, I can't get to everybody that I follow every week. So, but we're, I'm just trying to gauge like, you know, is this the best time to do this show? Is there other days? that may work better or whatever, but right now this is what we're doing. So how you want to roll this? Well, <laughs> I was going to try to find a image of a like castle with a walled city or like a wall around it. Yeah. That apparently is not a thing. <laughs> like it's, you know, like you see it in, in like all kinds of, you know, fantasy shows where it's like a, you know, like Game of Thrones or whatever, where there's this the the keep in the middle, and then yeah, there's a wall. So yeah, apparently there's not anything like that around anymore because I can't find any pictures of it. Uh, Vadelsberg. Vadelsberg Castle. What's up, John Pounders? Hey, what's up, what's Harley up? Roberts? <laughs> Thanks for so, chiming in, guys. Yeah, so I was gonna, I was gonna gonna show a picture, but I guess we could just kind of talk about um, and kind of like visualize what it looks like. So what we were going to kind of talk about was we're going to Here, talk uh, you when you talk. Sorry, I will draw <laughs> the city with my hands in this. I got it. Here, I'll, there we go. There you go. Okay, so go ahead and describe this castle. I have a, I have a black or like a whiteboard. I could do it. Yeah, yeah, this is a wall. I can draw on this wall if I want to. <laughs> this is my house. You know. Let's do it. No. That's what we, we need. Green <laughs> so we can just, yeah. you know, like have like, a little dude, I, dude, I'm telling you right now, this is like, there's a lot of things I'm good at, but doing the hand thing and trying to figure out where I'm at is not one of them. Man. <laughs> this is like the hardest thing ever to try to when it's reversed. Yeah. Everything's back. Oh man. I can't even see my hands. I don't even, yeah, I can't figure this out. Dude. It's horrible. All right. So yeah. So we just kind of wanted to talk about um, kind of the tactics of, of the enemy and and kind of give you an idea when we're talking about strongholds and hedges and um, like the enemy coming in and building a stronghold and you know what what repentance what all these things like if you imagine it use your imagination if you imagine this as, as a fortified castle like when God created you he created you your spirit in the center of a, like a walled city your castle or your temple in the center of a walled city and so some of the things that we talk about is like you have, you know, holes or doors open when we're talking spiritual. Um, there's holes in your walls or, you know, somebody's, you know, attacked your wall and torn your wall down. And now they have a way to get into, you know, your kind of sanctuary, the inside of the walls. So if you can imagine that, if you can imagine the, the center of that, like the castle in the middle, and then there's a wall, it's, you know, all the way around it. Some of the things that I, I, I I'd like to talk about are some of the things that we do that we 
open ourselves up to attack and open ourselves up for the enemy to come in. And then what the enemy does is he comes in and he builds these things called strongholds. Um, and for the information about a stronghold, there's a lot of things talked about biblically about people going into strongholds and what they represent. To me, it's kind of like uh, there's actually a lot of representation biblically of it being kind of like a cave or a cavern. Um, so if you can imagine, you know, a demonic entity has, has, has penetrated through your walls, through something that you've done, you've let your guard down and the enemy has broken through the outside wall and they have retreated into a stronghold. It's, you know, imagine a cave or something that they've kind of burrowed and, and buried themselves into. Um, so when we talk about tearing down that stronghold, it's exposing that enemy to attack. Biblically, when they talk about a stronghold, it meant that they were hiding in some place that was, you know, safe from attack. So what they were doing, what the spirits do when they go in and build a stronghold is they've basically fortified themselves inside of your walls so that, you know, now the enemy's inside the gates. Um, so when we talk about tearing down that stronghold, we have to, we're, we're talking about exposing that enemy so that you can kick it out. So when you're actually tearing down that stronghold, you're, it, it has burrowed itself into something into your life that has covered itself up. And so it makes it really hard for that enemy to be exposed. So the whole idea of tearing down a stronghold is exposing that enemy so that he has no place to go and hide. So if you can imagine a, a particular sin or something that you're involved in and all of the things that, that, you know, you tell yourself, well, I'm, I'm just that way. That's how I was. That's how I am. That's I was born this way. Or, you know, uh, I, I have, this is just how I feel, or I'm always angry. That's just, you know, because I came up in a certain type of family or whatever, whatever justification is that enemy burrowed down into your, your inside of your fortification. Those walls are the inside of you, right? So that enemy has hidden itself somewhere inside of your walls and it's fortified itself in there with this stronghold. So that's kind of like a little bit of information. I have the definition of a stronghold. It is a place of security or survival. Um, it uh, says one of the last strongholds of the ancient Gaelic language. So it comes from a Gaelic. Um, there was another definition of it that was better than this. Um, but it basically, let's just pull it up here because it gave me some good information. Yeah, for sure, man. I uh, I was looking for a verse that. Did you talk about, you know, what you're saying there about these, um, the enemy going in and burrowing in and setting up strong, strong fortification around, you know, these things that you struggles with, and then how he feeds you this this constant uh, back and forth in your mind that make you justify why it's okay that you struggle with this or why everyone else does. So it's not that big a deal. It's not salvation or whatever it is, whatever he knows exactly what you need to, you need to hear. Right. And I think sometimes, you know, you, what you have to understand is like the only, the only way he can leverage you is if you don't believe what God says about you, because that's, that's what he he holds over that shame over you right and you don't want that's why you have secret sin you don't want to tell people what it is because you're ashamed you know that's a huge thing i mean think about this if you look at just the news today you're ha you have the sextortion scandals with uh you got epstein's the most common one you're talking about now but there's many many more and i would i would probably say that 99 percent of people in power today are being handled uh you know out of you know, somebody's got some kind of shameful stuff on camera uh, that they're they're holding over their head to keep them keep them in line, or even just to set them up like in a place of a place of power. We know that some of these high level jobs you don't get to unless you're handled. I mean, it's just the way it is. So the enemy's the one behind that in, the, in anyways, and he's doing it in your life right now. He's he's handling you with the shame. So guess what? Part of exposure, part of the biggest weapon that's in our arsenal is repentance and being able to speak out your sin. You know, God, I know that I struggle with pornography or something, you know, whatever it is. And I know that you can take it from me. You can forgive me for it. I know that you already have. 
You know, that's the that is what we need to remember is that he's already done this. He did it. He won. The war is over. We just don't know. <laughs> we're being we're believing the lie. We we have to remember that he's outside of time and he's already promised us. And and so, you know, it's if you think of it like the binary, like we talked about in the film Quantum Illusion these are either open or closed the valve is open or closed it either you let the flow in or you don't and you get that by being humble being a servant being submitted right you show headship you know all that stuff to the one above you and it allows that opening so that the flow can flow right through so you already have god's god's promises are like a flowing river and you've got little taps going to it now they're blocked but once you repent, you release that flow, you accept and you believe the promise of God. What does he say about you? You unlock that flow. And all it all it takes is the turning of the valve a little bit through humbleness. Yeah. And it's, you know, but it's overwhelming. I mean, they're, they're called a stronghold for a reason. But yeah. that's the thing. I was going to say, uh, the, 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 the concept of the stronghold and the definition of it is a place that has been fortified as to protect against attack. So, again, we're, we're talking about this as being a war. And this is a war inside of your own walls, right? With, with a stronghold, you have an enemy that has gotten itself past your walls, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, but has gotten itself past your walls and it has built up a fortification inside of your city, right? Your spirit. And what this thing has done is it's built it one brick at a time by lies and deception. And each one of those lies and deception is a lie against what the Bible tells you that you are and who you are in Christ, right? Yeah. So each one of those lies is like, like I said, it's he, he he comes in and he's like, all right, I got to burrow in because this person, if they realize what's going on, they're going to start attacking me. Right. So here's the first lie. This is how you are. You were born this way. Then here's the next lie. You can't change it. This is you'll always be this way. Here's the next lie. You know, it only happens once or here's the next lie. It, you'll you'll change someday. Here's the next lie. And then he's by the time that he's gotten through all these lies where you haven't changed because you've listened to each one of them. Now he's built into the fabric of your existence. He's buried himself in there so that you don't even recognize that he's there. That's that fortification inside of your walls. So the first way that we're talking about of exposing this um, and it just depends on the sin, but is is being truthful with yourself. And realizing what the Bible says about who you are and what you represent, that we have the power and the strength against all of these oppressions, that it says that that we can do all things through God, right? So yeah. anything that we are we are fighting or struggling with, it can be defeated. It's the, the enemy telling you that it's not, that, that there's no way that that's going to happen. You'll never change. This is how you are, right? Well, the Bible says that you're not. You're a changed new creation, right? You have a new heart. Your heart is, is, is struggling towards being the best person that you can be right that's if you're feeling that kind of like oh but i'm struggling with this well that means god's working on you because like i've said before if you're if you if if you look at yourself before you became a christian those things didn't even bother you when you were doing it that whole like, concept of you having that struggle you having that 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 but why do i keep doing this right that is god inside of you showing you that that's a problem right because before you didn't even you didn't even care right you send without without care you just did whatever and you may have felt bad after about it afterwards but in the process you didn't even think about it because it was part of who you are right so that's the stronghold so the first thing we have to do is expose you have to tear down those walls those lies right of that that entity that has got itself into your walls right you have to tear down those lies right and then it tells us that we have to clean house, right? So now that we've exposed him, he's standing there. He he is vulnerable to attack, right? And the Bible tells us that we have to kick them out. We have to expel them from our lives. You know, this is the part about repenting and turning from our sin because we don't want them to come back, right? So we're going to be kicking. We're going to be turning our back on this sin, on this lie, this 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 junk that this thing has been feeding us for so long, right? And we're going to kick it out and say, you need to get out, right? Now there's warning in the Bible about casting out demons it says if you cast out a demon and you don't fill that void right if you this thing is dug in right it's got a hole right in in your in your ground right if you do not fill that with something then that enemy comes back and sees that there is an empty house and he goes and gets seven of his friends and that person is worse off than when they started right so the next course of action is whatever that sin was whatever you are struggling with now needs to be filled with time with god you know 
if it, like we talk about secret sin, we talk about, you know, uh, pornography, things like that, instead of going and getting on the internet and watching yeah. porn, maybe you should open a Bible hub and start reading some, you know, instead of porn hub, go to Bible hub, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and start spending some time with God in that place. Because I guarantee you, if you get that thought and that lie comes to you, if you go and you study and spend time with God, you're not even going to be wanting to do that anymore. Right. Like that just needs to be our go-to instead of, well, this is just what you do or I'm bored or, you know, whatever. Right. It, it, we need to change our, fo our focus. Right. Right. Instead of focusing on the things of this world and the things that cause us to falter right now, we need to fill that time with, with God. I hear people all the time say, you know, well, I don't have enough time. I, and I, I can completely understand that. I mean, with everything that I do in my life, I have a lot of like time that just kind of seems like it disappears. Right. But then there's a right. lot of times when I, when I reevaluate my life and see the things like, when I'm on Facebook, there's actually a thing on Facebook that'll tell you how much time you spend on Facebook. And when I opened it up and checked it, it was two hours and 45 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. That's my average. That's two hours and 45 minutes. I could be doing a lot of other things. Now that I, I still think that that's just because my app is open. I'm not one of those people that close out all my apps, but that's still a lot of time. You know, the same thing with television, with with a lot of other things that we can, we spend our time doing that we should be spending with God, right? So. Right. Now we're filling in right that void so that that demon when it comes back, it's it's home where it's been forever has now been torn down and filled in. It can't fit him or his buddies in. So he's still exposed. Right. So when that devil comes, when that entity, whatever comes back and he starts trying to attack you, now he's exposed. He doesn't have any place to go and hide. His stronghold is torn down. And, and all you can do is what, what the Bible says is resist the devil like on. Resist. resist. That's what the resistance is, guys. Right? He doesn't have a place to go. So now you resist him again, like you did the first time, and kick him back out, right? And you can do that with scripture. You know, yep. read Proverbs, read Psalms. So let me let me show you. I'm going to show you an example of how you do this right here. You could take any verse, right? And it, and this really helps too. I started doing this a couple couple well oh, maybe a year ago. Um, you take a verse and you you change the way you read it. You put yourself in there. Right. Uh, and you change. So th this is Isaiah 40, 31. You say uh, it says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. But you would change that to I find my hope in you, Lord, and you renew my strength. Right. You're putting you're personalizing this verse. Isaiah 41, 10. Uh, I do not fear. I know you are with me. I am not dismayed. You are my God. You strengthen me and you uphold me with your righteous right hand. These are the these are what he says he will do in these verses. You're declaring them. You're putting a decree out there that it's done. You know, like this is done, Lord. You, you're you're accepting it by faith by declaring it to be right now. Whatsoever you declare in heaven or earth, right? Uh, whatsoever you declare in heaven will be loosed on earth, right? That kind of stuff. This is how you do it, and and, and just. When you start to when you start to look at look at this scripture like this, like what you were talking about when you cast them out and you have to fill these voids with something, you can you can immediately fill the void. Um, you you can you know pray that the Holy Spirit come in and set up shop and say bring joy right where where you lost this emotion right and you have fear of possibility that you know this the enemy might come back stronger. You rebuke it and you fill that with you know joy and try you know. Um, Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace, all joy and peace as you trust him. So as you're walking this out, sometimes all it is, is God wants you to take that first step, right? He tells you what's here. He, you know that this is a big issue. Say you are dealing with pornography, right? That's a huge thing, man. And it can destroy your life. And it is very hard to, to get out of the way of the shame that comes with that stuff. And, you know, but the thing is, the more you talk about that with your buddies and things like that, and you realize, guess what? Every guy, every guy has dealt with this issue. You're not alone, which you feel isolated and you feel like you're the dirtiest guy out there. You can't possibly tell people about this. That's the shame. That's wicked. You know, you, you deny that stuff. You bring in the scripture. What does the scripture say about you? It helps to have people around you, too. As soon as you involve a brother, they go to fight for you, with you. Right. It makes it even better. Sometimes you need that. You know, it's just a mental thing. Yep. And I have seen <clears throat> I have actually there was a, a, a pastor. Um, I can't 
really remember who it was, but he talked about how he struggled with pornography. And what he did was he had a brother in, in you know, a brother in the Messiah, right? That, that he was like, he trusted and, and he kind of, they, they had this kind of go-to back and forth. And he put one of those apps on his phone that blocked, you know, or tracked any, any websites or whatever. It was kind of out of his control, but he gave the information to his buddy that would hold him accountable. Whatever websites he went to, his buddy could see that and hold him accountable. And you can do that with your wife, you know, your husband. But no, if you've never heard Adam Wegman's story, uh, he's, I believe, wasn't Wegg, he was on Disputed Lands, wasn't he? I think he was. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like the first week Ducky was on there. But yeah, so uh, go look that up. Adam Wegman, man, he's got a heck of a testimony about that, man, uh, being delivered from pornography and, and how his marriage was rescued. But I know that he and his wife, he gave up his phone. He gave up his computer, his alone time. He didn't have any for months, you know, just because he, he couldn't trust himself. So he just gave it away. Like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to give a personal testimony. I know a lot of you guys have already heard me speak about this before uh, on this show um, in the last couple of weeks. But this Freedom Conference that I went to, uh, I don't even remember. It was a couple, six weeks, maybe eight weeks. I don't know, two months ago at the most. When I got freed from cigarettes and, and uh, tobacco and stuff. Um, I had been trying to do that for almost 20 years. And I was a heavy smoker, man. And I didn't honestly want to get rid of it. Everybody told me I should. I felt convicted a little bit, but I also liked it. I, also, I found ways to justify it. It was a massive stronghold in my life. Uh when I went to this conference and I just literally put everything out there and told God to come in and clean me out. And even the things that I didn't know I had or whatever it is, because I know a lot of times you have, you, you, you see smoking is not the issue, right? Smoking is just a symptom of whatever that root is. So, but a lot of times these roots go deep, they go subconscious level, you know, um, something has imprinted right through a trauma through some kind of attachment process it's it's burrowed in and it's attached somewhere you don't know this i prayed so many times to get rid of cigarettes i could not do it okay on my own i even asked for god's help and i couldn't do it because i was praying wrong i was literally trying to tell god i was going at it from a knowledge standpoint like god tell me what it is and i will fix it i just wanted him to do this like you know, uh, diagnostics and be like, Oh, it's this, you need to fix that. But instead I just had to give it to him. Like I wanted, to, I just had to say, I can't do any of this. I need you. I don't even care what it's attached to at this point. It needs to be gone. You know, it needs to happen. Get it out. I don't want any part of it. I, you know, I like it. So it's just going to make it harder. If you involve me in this process, just eliminate it. Right. But then once he says, okay, then you have to stand on the promises that the victory has been won, right? He gave you freedom from it. He, he severed the ties. Then it was my responsibility to step in the, in the first and second and third and fourth time I felt like a cigarette because it didn't go away. I wanted it for two weeks probably. My entire lifestyle was built around that, and I didn't recognize it until – I I'm only now recognizing how much of my life – that had a hold of because there's a lot of lost time smoking cigarettes, yeah. man. I mean, it, <clears throat> there is. and I'm not bashing anybody that smoke. I've also been able to witness to people a lot smoking cigarettes because you're, you're hanging out out front of the buildings or behind the buildings and there's guys back there smoking and you automatically, you have something in common with these people. And, and I used to think like if, if, if this was such a big deal, maybe God, you know, I wouldn't have so many opportunities like this. You know, God must, you know, he's work, he's able to work through it. So what's the big deal, right? That's not the issue. The issue is that, you know, it it's it's far more complex sometimes than than you need to know that you that you can even you wouldn't even understand. But he can take that from you and you can stand on the promises that he's already taken it through faith. And you are a new creature and you can rebuke the shame. You can rebuke the enemy when he comes after you, as he will. And you can be free, man. And I'll tell you right now, I feel great. I uh, 
I have a lot of free time. Well, I've filled it with other things now. Nothing like nothing, no more vices, hopefully. But um, I also uh, have more joy. My wife is very appreciative of this. But like there's also other things that um, I feel like a peace and a rest that I didn't feel before. And I don't know if that's exactly what it was, like whatever the issue was there, because I can't even specify you know, what necessarily the issue was that was that stronghold, but it's dealt with and I don't necessarily want to know, you know, I believe that I'm healed and I'm standing on that and that's all that matters. And I think when you get big victories like this, you can't not help but want to see freedom for other people. So it's, it's really, it's exciting because this is the kind of stuff that the scripture is talking about. When you receive this freedom, this free gift and then, you know, the salvation is only part of it, but he can, he can free up you, your, your mind. If you just ask him and you slowly start working to build those muscles and watch him change your life. It's amazing. And then you cannot help, but be filled with boldness and want to go and tell people about it. Right. So, yeah. <clears throat> so we were talking about, um, the, the strongholds that the enemy has, right. And it, we can't talk about the strongholds that the enemy has without talking about the strongholds that we have. We also have a place of retreat. And I got a couple of scriptures. Um, Secual, or Second Samuel 22, 3. Well, I can't say that fast. Um, <laughs> it says, my Elohim, my rock, in whom I take ref refuge, my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. Right. And that's Second Samuel 22, 3. Um, then we have Psalm nine nine it says yahweh also will be a stronghold for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble and then we have psalms 18 2 and it's yahweh my rock and my fortress my deliverer my elohim my rock who i may take refuge my shield and my horn of my salvation my stronghold right so again there's three three scriptures telling you that we have a stronghold we can retreat to so when the enemy is advancing and trying to attack us, we need to be retreating to where? To Yahweh, right? We got to be going back to the word. We need to be going back to time with him. We can retreat when the enemy attacks. So when we have a Job situation or we have, you know, major oppression going on in our lives right now, we need to be doing exactly what the enemy was doing to us. And we need to bury ourselves in the arms of, of our creator, right? That's what we really need to be doing because that's the only way we're going to win this battle, right? Is we have to retreat. And then when we get strong enough, then we can attack this enemy and take it out, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of, we've covered the enemy's stronghold, what happens when they get inside of our walls. And we are now talking about Yahweh being our stronghold, right? So kind of like our castle. So I don't know if anybody's ever played like city simulators or, or anything like that, where you build a city and it starts out like it's just a house or a building and then you have to put streets and roads. Well, our spirit is no different than that, right? Mm -hmm. So when we are born, we start with, you know, our soul, our spirit right in the center of this walled city. Now, this walled city may only just be a shrubbery, you know, or a hedge, as we, we call it, right? Uh, that goes around us. <clears throat> it's not fully built up it hasn't had the experience to realize that we're being attacked that we're in a war all of this kind of stuff right so you may have started working on you know the, the sewer system and the houses and the buildings and the streets but you didn't really concentrate on the walls because you didn't realize this was a war so when the enemy comes you're like what the heck you know we just got raided i, I don't even know what happened right so we want to talk about the outside right those walls right for one building them up and 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 how the enemy gets through and how they're attacking the walls, right? So one of the things I really like to talk about is generational stuff. It's a lot of stuff that we are susceptible to because of the sins of the father, which can be can cause curses down our family lines for three to four generations, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have family and friends that are involved in witchcraft or could have, I, I used to tell this to people all the time about, um, like, because I had a lot of girls that I that, that were friends of mine growing up that had it, it almost seemed like they were rubber stamped with like, you know, uh, molest me, you know, thing because it was like the grandma was was molested by her uncle and then that 
daughter, the mom was molested by her brother. And then that kid was molested by her stepdad. It just seems generationally, it was like, boom, 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 boom. It was like a rubber stamp <clears throat> that was on there. That, you know, just said, you know, attack me. Right. Yeah. And you see this kind of stuff and it's terrible, but it's generational. And that stuff was never, never stopped, never finished off. And this is, this isn't just, in that instance, I've seen it with alcohol abuse. I've seen it with pornography. I've seen it with child molestation. I, there's just like all of these categories. Anger can be one, pride. These are things that you say, well, my dad was like this. That's why I'm like this. That's a lie from the devil, right? Mm -hmm. You know what it is. It's a curse, right? And it's our, I always like to say it's like a, a graph, right? So as we're growing in God, so we have the zero line. So if you, if you know the bottom line of a graph, right? That's our zero line. That is whatever sin we default. Right. So that's the sins of our father. We, we will default into this line. Right. Okay. So we'll, God will build us up and then we'll fall and we'll go. We'll, you know, I, I don't know how many times when I was in the bar industry, I would get drunk and I'm not an angry person. But then I would end up in a bar fight. Right. Okay. I'm not the kind of person that goes out and looks for fights. But if I'm drunk, I'm defaulting to the, the sins of my father. Right. My dad had a lot of anger problems. Mm -hmm. Right. So he dealt with a lot of other things that I don't have to deal with, but that was something that it, it took me a long time to make sure that I didn't default back into. Right. right. So, uh, we have a lot of these sins that we default to that just happens to be the thing that like, you know, when, when everything is going bad, you default to depression or you default to, um, you know, like we talk about pornography or addiction or drugs or alcoholism, this is your default, right? This is from the sins of the father. That's because there's a gaping hole that was when you're, when you were created, there's a gaping hole in your wall that didn't get built because your, 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 your generations before you didn't repair that. So when you were created, your plan, is, you know, you're a duplicate image of, you know, your mother and father. So they put together and started building this city. Now it has a giant hole in this one, one section. So this is one of the ways that the enemy gets through because there's no protection there, right? So generational stuff is a huge thing that we have to deal with. If you notice that you default to certain sins or whatever in times of trouble and times of whatever, that needs to be that, that hole in that wall definitely needs to be a, like a concentration that we need to build and fortify that. And you do that by, for one, recognizing that the sin is there, that you're not just like that because your parents were like that or because something happened to you, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but that needs to be repaired. And you take that to the father and you say, father, this is something in me, you know, that my parents did or, or whatever. And, and you can repent for your generations and you yeah. can repent for the sin and say, look, my dad may have done it. My grandpa may have done it. My great grandfather may have done it but I am going to stop this here. Right. And I want to repent and repent. You're going to turn 360 or not 360. I always say that you're going to turn 180 and walk away from that sin. You are going to do whatever you can to walk away from that sin so that you don't default to that anymore. And yeah. whatever triggers, whatever things that, have, that cause you to get into that sin, like I said, alcoholism, right? The whole thing with anger. Well, if I don't drink, I don't default to that sin. So, what do I, I just don't drink. Right. So yeah, you, you get away from that. Right. So that's kind of one of the things that, that, that generationally, like I said, you can repent for the sins of your father, right? You can repent for your own participation in that. And then you can ask God to, to fortify that hedge, to rebuild that section so that the enemy cannot use that against you anymore. The enemy is not going to get through there and say, well, you're just like, this is because this is how your family is. This is how you're made. This is how, you know, whatever. Right. Yep. So that is, is getting, that is that generational gap in the wall that, that I wanted to start talking to you, you wanted to add. Well, yeah, I was just going to promo mm -hmm. some of our, one of our buddies because he has a book. His, his testimony is exactly this, right? The hope that comes through breaking generational curses and bondage. So uh, many of you know that through the black ministries here and the resistance, uh, we, we deal with SRA and uh, bringing mm -hmm. attention to that and what it is. And, um, part of a satanic ritual abuse is meant it is meant to put generational curses on you from birth and it started with the nazis through the labensborn program where they would ritually abuse and, and do things to these pregnant women to try to impart and, and and attach demonic entities to the fetus before birth right so that it's born with this uh 
higher proclivity for supernatural uh, abilities and and like you know telekinesis and all these different things that they were looking for but it's a it's very it's a very real thing that these generational curses these are doorways that are left open uh, and purposely opened between the you know the veil and in here that are meant to attach these entities and allow them to work through that that's exactly what you're you you can grow the you can get these now but you can also there are people that are born with these on purpose right and nathan reynolds his his family line that's exactly what they were doing and he had been a part of this system and god reached in and snatched him out of the flames right and set him free and now he's having he has a daughter who is the will be the first generation of freedom in so many you know generations past and he wrote a book about that called snatch from the flames it's his testimony and that story of redemption and you should buy that book nathan is super cool and we're going to have him on the show in a couple of weeks uh whenever he can make time for us the dude lives in an rv so <laughs> and i definitely well, I definitely suggest that people should buy yeah, it it's an amazing it's story book. yes but and they, he also has it, an audio version of it that he's been publishing and putting on youtube so yeah, right. we've been going through each chapter and reading it and, and that's fully available to everyone. But I yeah. highly recommend getting the book just to support him because he's a fantastic guy. So a mm -hmm. um, couple back to kind of I, I have two more passages about the, the Yahweh being our, our stronghold. So, again, we retreat like when we have that hedge, we 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 know how we, we go to repair that. Right. We have to have the understanding that there is a zero line, a thing that we're defaulting, a proclivity to sin that we keep falling back into. We have to recognize that and stop listening to the lies of the enemy it tells us that that's how we are, right? No, that's not true. You know, Satan is a liar and he will lie to you and tell you that this is how you are, right? No, the Bible says completely different. You are a son of the most high, right? You were adopted and you're grafted, right? And and we stand in the, in the light of the father, right? And no sin, can can be there right so mm -hmm. this is this is our truth right don't let the the enemy lie to you and tell you that this is how you are and and here's two more passages that we retreat back to the father and have him repair this right this wall um psalm 31 2 incline your ear to me rescue me quickly be a rock of my strength a stronghold to save me and that's psalms uh psalm 31 2 uh psalm 46 7 is Yahweh of hosts is with us. Elohim of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah, right? So there's two more, right? We know that the enemy is coming through and he's, he's inside of our gates, right? And he's trying to attack us. So now, again, it's another, it's the process of kicking that enemy out, right? So we have to recognize, expose that enemy, repent, throw that enemy out of our walls and then retreat to the father and have the father rebuild that wall for us, right? So now that is generational. Now we're going to talk about how the the enemy attacks and creates holes in our wall that that weren't intended to be there, right? So he taught he touched on a little bit with SRA, um, which is for those that don't know, is sexual or satanic ritual abuse, and usually that is done through sexual sexual you know attacks and on a small child. Um, there's MK Ultra mind control. There's a whole lot of ways that they break and shatter people. And if you ever get the, the opportunity to look into it, I would I would say do it in small sections because yes, yeah, it, it is it's a lot to take in. I, I must have studied it for probably a year and a half and just get to a point where it was like I I gotta take a break. This is wow. too much, you know. <laughs> you, yeah, and if you if you would like to look into it and you're not familiar with a really a good website to go to, Londonhasasecret.com. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the guys, the 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 Tom and Jared, they hit on a lot of this stuff um but uh yeah so we want to talk about them attacking and tearing down the walls a lot of these things happen to at, at young ages there are i mean I, I just saw a video the other day about a, a, a two parents who were feeding their child like they were videotaping feeding their child alcohol and this baby was less than a year old and they were giving it alcohol right i mean that's just terrible but there are there are worse things that happen to children at younger ages there's a lot of people um, and David Arthur is is a friend of ours, and he will talk about this. I've had conversations with him about the LGBTQ community, about how a lot of them were 
they had they were molested as a child and sometimes before they're i mean who remembers before they're two years old right yeah we could talk about the kinsey institute which is here in my right. own state and all of the things that they did to you know figure out human sexuality i i, I studied human psychology and human sexuality and kinsey was a like a pervert and the things yeah. that they did to kids before they were the age of two years old these kids are don't remember it and they did no study to track where these kids are at now they only studied them for that short period of time while they did some really disgusting things to them and then sent them back out into the world who knows where they're at today how i mean whether whether they got into drugs whether they you know they had uh uh, aversions to certain sexualities or, or whatever they didn't study any of that those people are out in the world now who were basically molested as children for science and it's just ridiculous but yeah, it's not science it's, at all no no it was it was just perversion is what it was but perversion. um i have i've dealt with a lot of people like i said i studied human psychology and human sexuality before i i got into the whole understanding of what i am and what god's calling me to be i was dealing with things with my friends and realizing that a lot of them were molested as children especially girls there i i don't know how many friends that i had that were molested as 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 children and then they're as they become teenagers and adults they were just crazy into this whole like sexuality thing and they were just everywhere like right. i mean it just got crazy because they were kind of introduced to it when their brain wasn't ready to or they felt like it was from somebody that loved them and this is how you get people to love you is to just mm -hmm. have sex with them um well so i have a, something to say that goes on top of that so i'm in a small group with the local church that i go to and there's uh five or six couples okay and when we were we went to that freedom conference we, we were dealing with all these issues and, and going and praying together and everything and found out that when it came to the abuse topic when we started dealing with the abuse and uh, getting clean from that, there was one person from every couple that had been sexually abused. That's insane. I mean, we know that the people that study this, you know, that are doing that are involved in sex trafficking prevention and, and awareness and, and deal with SRA and things like that. I mean, we can say these things, um, but I, I guess, to me personally, I knew the figures, but when you see it in real life, in, in your group of friends, how many people are actually affected with something like that? Like, you know, to know that it used to be like, um, you know, these figures were like for, you know, other things like one in four people will suffer from diabetes or whatever. Right now it's one person in every couple has been sexually abused. What? You know, like this is insanity. When and, and it's, it's most of the time, it's it, it's from somebody a trusted family member. Yeah, yeah because of, of accessibility. Yeah. And, and 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 most of those times, it is because that person suffered that, and that's just how they, you know, it, it's it was it's it's normal to them because it's what happened to them growing up, right? And then it's just spirals and continues, right? If, yeah, the pyramid scheme. You know, it's a pyramid scheme of perversion. One person starts it and then that person does it to two people and that person does it, you know, those two people do it to two more people and four people. And then it just becomes, it's out of control, right? But right. that does not mean that God cannot forgive you for anything that you participated in and can't repair that wall as well. This is another thing that we need to talk about. Like, I know, it. like I said, now the enemy has gotten passed through, through something that happened to you as a child, whether it be, like I said, it could be abuse. It could be being physically abused. It could be rejection from your family. I mean, there's a, there's many different things. We kind of focused on, on, on the sexual aspect of it, but like I said, rejection has been a huge thing. Anger, yeah. abuse, alcoholism. These are all things that can, that as a child, you can see we are products of not only the spiritual realm, but of our environment and the way that we're raised and the people that are around us. So this is just, we're just touching on. Yeah this one aspect right and I, I dealt with rejection and i didn't even realize i did until later on but it was a product of a bad divorce right well there's no good divorce okay so let's just get that out of here um my experience was pretty bad but i'm, I'm not i don't know of a whole lot of people that are like my divorce was actually really nice you know was, i've had nothing but peace uh, if that's you whatever but, but uh, for me it was a, a big deal and i i got that was a traumatic event that that event caused post-traumatic stress right ptsd 
we talk about this all the time, but for some reason we only attribute it to like uh, being mugged or going to war or something like that. And you don't realize that you every single person that deals with trauma and your body fragments, your, your soul fragments, right? And every time, you know, it, you, it shatters a little piece of you and it's, it's to save you. This is a, a normal thing. This is how God made you, right? To deal with traumas. Um, but you, you once you recognize that everything that you go through, these, these experiences cause trauma that you need healing from, you need to be integrated because the, what's the verse that says that uh, can a double-minded man serve, serve God? And no, you can't because you're double-minded, right? Well, you can be fractured and be double-minded. That's double-minded. You're a mirror of yourself, right? And that's only if you have one, but you can have a, a bunch of these things and you just need integration. And the word um, in the verse where uh, Jesus says he came to heal the brokenhearted, right? That that word means fractured soul uh, in Hebrew and in Greek. So he knew, he, he knew what, you know, he knows about this. <laughs> he's the one that created it. He knows how to fix it. And he's telling us he, he came to fix it. You don't have to live like this. You can be fixed. And I dealt with rejection big time. I didn't know that that's what the, that was a root of a lot of different things. And it was because I felt, you know, like I had done something to deserve this somehow. And that I had made my bed and now I'm required to lay in it. Right. Like this is just how my life's going to be now. It's terrible. But I did this, you know, so now I have to pay child support and lose custody of my kids and live in a different home and deal with debt and, you know, I don't know, feel unloved and start over pretty much, you know, you lose your home, you lose all this stuff, you pretty much start over, you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. This is a very traumatic thing. And I, I found healing through that through forgiveness. And you would never believe that the root of rejection is forgiveness, you know, yeah. or one of them. And it was amazing because, you know, a lot of people say that you don't forgive for the other person. It's for you. Well, it's definitely true. And I can attest yeah. to that for sure. Well, that's that is part of the way of of repairing those walls. Like right. the forgiveness aspect, especially for the things that have been done to you, like even generationally, you can be mad at your family for the way that they, you know, that your dad was an alcoholic and now you have a proclivity towards alcoholism, whatever. And you can hate him and despise him or you can forgive him. Right. That also sets him free from that bondage. Right. There's there's passages, uh, which is a there's a parable that Jesus talks about where and I can I can we'll have to go up and look at it. But where the, the debtor owes, you know, this king some money and, and he says, you know, don't throw me in jail, blah, blah, blah. You know, he says, I'll, I'll repay it back to you. But then he turns around and then goes and, and pennies on the dollar goes and beats up one of his fellow, you know, friends or whatever and says, you know, you only owe me a couple of dollars, even though I owed this king, you know, thousands or millions or whatever. But so I'm going to take you to jail. And then when the king finds out about it, you know, he's angry at the person. says, look, I gave I gave you lenience and you turned around and did this to somebody else. This is now I'm going to send you to the, the same punishment you were doing to this person. Right. There's there's an aspect of like jailing a person with un if you don't forgive them, like you're holding them to that sin and it's also damaging to you. So part of repairing that wall is forgiveness, um, forgiveness of those that have harmed you, done you wrong, set you on the wrong path, things like that. So that is part of repairing. And that's something that God will deal with. And we, like I said, God is our stronghold. We, we retreat back to him. He's going to have us repair that wall. And one of those ways to repair that is the forgiveness aspect. We've got a couple more passages here because you were talking about um, like being broken and shattered, right? It's mm -hmm. like a city that is broken into and without walls is a man who has no control over his spirit. That's Proverbs 25, 28. So it's like the, the whole broken walls thing, right? If you don't have control over your spirit, then your walls are just in shambles. Like they're just in pieces, right? And you were talking about how, how the shattering aspect. Well, just imagine a city under siege, right? They're lobbing cannonballs at the wall and tearing it down. Well, that's that wall is part of you. And when well, that's one of the things wall, too. And the defense of that would be <laughs> you, you you would retreat. They used to build these in the, in the castles. They used to build these super super narrow hallways and passages, right? Because if in the case that the walls were breached, they retreat to an inner court or something, and then you fight man to man coming through that. You don't get bombarded with this horde of you know, warriors coming in 
they can only go one at a time through these, and then you can literally fight them as they come through one at a time. Right, it's a right. defensive move, but it was they built their city for that specific reason. Yeah. You know, if they were breached, there's another court or there's another wall, That's another layer. Harley Roberts says forgiveness is mortar. So when you're rebuilding that wall, the forgiveness yeah. is the mortar. I like that. That's, that's yeah, good. I like that too. Um, so the next, the next one I have is in Ecclesiastes 10, eight, he who digs a pit may fall into it and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall, right? So a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. If Yahweh and his ways are our stronghold, our protective hedge, then whenever we are disobedient to Yahweh, we break through that wall that may be bitten or we break through that wall and may be bitten by a serpent. Understand this means spiritually. When Yahweh's protective hedge around us is broken, our sin and unrighteousness, it gives the enemy an opportunity to penetrate our wall of truth and lies <clears throat> with lies and deception. These lies and deception, if left, will multiply and lead us away from the truth into sin. Keep this in mind as we continue. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so we're talking about the strongholds thing. Um, so we got, let's see, the walls. Oh, yeah. So we were talking about um, them penetrating the walls. So we talked about childhood, things that can happen early on that can, you know, have devastating effect on our on our walls, our perimeter. And we talk about sins of the father, you know, generational curses, things like that. The other thing is like what Ian was talking about here was things that happen to us as adults, right? So things that you know, we've, we thought we, we got our walls going, everything's, you know, doing pretty good. Right. And then we have something that hits us and, and is damaging to a, a portion of our wall, like things like a divorce, which I also went through too. I had, you know, if anybody's seen my uh, testimonial, I had a lot of situations that happened as an adult when I kind of walked away and was kind of doing my own thing that were very damaging to my wall. And it took a long time for God to, to go back through and build up those walls to where I am today. Um, because there were a lot of attacks that came through those open walls. Um, so there are things like in my case, um, I had uh, had somebody that I was with that had an abortion. And that was devastating to me. I had a, had a, a child out of wedlock. And when that relationship fell apart, I was used to seeing my son every single day. And then him being pulled away from me. And I only get to see him every, you know, every weekend or whatever that when that first happened was devastating to me i didn't get to see my kid every day i didn't get to, that was like my joy you know and and i learned so much from having a child and that just really hurt and i had to learn how to forgive and learn how to continue to pray for these people and and, and things like that so there are things as adults that we can do that can really cause us problems and you know like we've talked about alcoholism drug use is another one um, and I'm not just talking about, oh, well, I, you know, I take CBD oil or I made a pot cookie. No, I'm talking about heavy drug use. Or you oh. work in you, your, your business is to build hemp creek houses <laughs> and you're just around the fumes of it all the time. No, I, I mean, I don't even look, I, honestly, I don't even look at marijuana as a gateway drug. Alcohol is the true gateway drug. I mean, if we want to be honest about it. Um, but it, heavy drug use, especially things that are... Um, uh, what is it? Uh, what, what psychosomatic, whatever the thing is that, you know, yeah. you could trip, you know, yeah, have things like your mushrooms, acid, um, I'm trying to think of all the Ecstasy. new ones now. <laughs> Ecstasy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many, DMT, all of these things. These are things that like open holes in your wall, right? Where the people are having like DMT experiences where they're seeing the these spirit entities and like everybody has had the same experience, but I mean, that's not good, right? You're just oh. opening the front door for the enemy to come in. Right. So that's something that's, that is another thing that, you know, if you've dealt with any kind of drug, drug, you know, methamphetamines, any kind of, you know, psycho psychosomatic drugs, any kind of thing like that, that has opened the door. You've, like I said, you've just swung the, the front door open and lowered the drawbridge because you've just allowed, everyone and their mom to come in and, and play around inside of your spirit. Right. So we, that is something that you definitely have to turn away from. That is something that you definitely have to close the door and repent from so that you are sealing that back up because that is a gateway, no different than um, shamans, you know, Indian shamans used to do these things to open up the gates to the spirit world. That is a, like a way that opens your third eye. So we're seeing into a realm that we shouldn't be messing with. Right. And that, that door, 
just doesn't close by itself, right? <laughs> so well, let me tell you this too. I, 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 there's a lot of sharing going on tonight, but I, I another thing I feel led, led to share. So I know when you're talking about healing, especially from uh, the psychedelic drugs and, and, and gateways and doors being opened in your mind to the spirit realm, a lot of times, um, you know, I, I know a few people that have seen visions like the, that the Lord has given them at those times, kind of like a rescue moment where it, it's, it's almost like you go in intending something else and then you get, you know, confronted <laughs> by the watcher right the lord the yahweh he comes in and he's like i still see you right now you know what i mean like and then he can use anything meant for evil he can turn around and make it good right so he can show you things like if you want that you might be going in trying to open your third eye to get some kind of experience he could use that for his glory right and then sometimes like you may like you say you're doing dmt all the time or whatever and you end up having a dream that's led you to the Christian faith, right? And maybe you're now you have this relationship and you've you've had this experience that is associated with that salvation moment. And then you get convicted by psychedelic drugs or you know the the direction that you went towards opening these pathways, right? The third eye type pathways. Maybe you didn't even know that's what you were doing, but unintentionally you were doing that, right? Now you feel like you can't be healed. Or you don't necessarily want the healing because now all of this stuff that you associate with your faith is attached to it in your mind. Like if I get healed from this, then maybe I won't have that experience. And I won't have, you know, I won't uh, I won't have the same gifting. I won't have the same. I won't be headed down the same path. I won't be, you know what I mean? There's a lot of issues that you could you could try to tell yourself like, hey. And the only reason I'm saying this is because I didn't even realize this was a thing until I was being prayed for once. And the guy said, I feel like the spirit is telling me to tell you that we need to pray right now. That you need a declaration statement uh, that you will be the same person when you get healed of this. It's not going to change you. It's God made you the way that you are for a specific purpose right and you're the way that you are finding him this this whole thing this process of your testimony is actually his testimony right it's his it's going to be his story of how you found him right or how he rescued you that's what the testimony is so just because you have a bondage now from this doesn't mean you can't be healed you know, it's not going to take away anything. You can still find healing right there and still be used in the, in the exact same manner that he would have used you intentionally in the beginning. You know, so. Well, and, and, you know, the bad thing about, so we, a couple of videos ago, I talked about like how this, how us tapping into the spiritual realm is kind of like having an antenna, right? Like the airways that you have, like when you're playing with your radio, right? If you're tuned in, you're tuning into God, you're going to hear his voice. But if you're not tuning into God, you're picking up all the other off-air radio, right? You're, you're, yeah. You've got static, you've got AM channels, you're picking up this and that, right? And it, it's the same thing when, you know, I don't I ever recommend anybody going and doing, you know, nar psychedelic drugs, that kind of stuff to have a, a religious experience, right? Because you don't know what you're going to get. We know that Satan is a liar and he might give you 90% truth and 10% lie, right? right? And the enemy, you might tap in and you might have some some really great experiences but the enemy is crafty and yeah. he can come in and he can he can also sneak his way in there too so you have to be really careful with those kind of situations and not you know just like the thing if god is gonna he doesn't need god is all powerful he doesn't need you know experiences like that to reach out and talk to you, you know? when you see this is one of the things we feel like he might because you're like oh i don't hear i don't see things like that right like you, you see all these other people that talk about visions and things. Uh, but, you know, maybe they did open doorways and, and that's why they're getting that in that realm now. But, you you know, you don't want that. You don't, you know, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to try to tell God how to, how to speak to you. You don't want to go down those paths because ultimately you're faced every day with the same choice uh, that you were, that Adam and Eve faced in the garden, right? 
the tree, whether you're going to eat from the tree of knowledge or the tree of life, every single day you get confronted with that, that choice. And the enemy is going to come after you and tell you, did he say this? Is that really how this is going to go down? Don't you want to know, right? Don't you want to know? Because, I mean, the tree of life is all about faith and trust, right? And your God, and your, God your father's provision. The tree of knowledge is, you know, it, it it's only a selfish move to try to, you know, because it says you'll be like God, right? And you can try. Personal because, knowledge. Well, it's well, personal knowledge, but it's also knowledge of God because it says you, you will find, it says you will have knowledge of good and evil. So you have knowledge of good, right? right. And so the reason you would have knowledge of good is because you're trying to please God, but you're trying from a wrong approach. Right. From this knowledge approach, right? Well, the Apparently, aspect, the yeah. aspect of gnosis and and of who right. the Gnostics were was trying to get to God by other means, right? Through the attainment of knowledge, like right. and this right. is what you see in esoteric, the esoteric like theology is is you attain enough of knowledge that you elevate yourself and you become a god yourself, right? You have to attain something, you have to do something. It's it's another way of getting to God than through you know, Yeshua, the Messiah, right? Yeah. It's try. it's, it, that's what, that's what separates religion from the, the, the belief structure and the relationship with God. Religion tries to use every other means to get to God, except through the bridge, our Messiah, right? That is the only way to get to God is through the Messiah. So, and I think we're stuck in this, you know, I, it's a paradigm shift that you need, right? You need to just realize like, Instead of trying to like structure your life, like I need to learn this, I need to do this, I'm going to sign up for that class because I got to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to do this. And then hopefully in five years, I'll be an effective soul winner and I'll have all that stuff. That's all good. But realize that you don't need any of that stuff to be an effective soul winner. All you need is the Holy Spirit. Right. Like you can literally, he doesn't even want you to necessarily know all that. He just wants you to trust him and have faith, right? To take that step. If he directs you to go somewhere, you go there. Without hesitation. Sometimes I feel like when you know something, it, it becomes a crutch now. Like I have to know more because I feel like I need to. I don't like going in situations. No one likes going in situations where they don't know anything, right? But but when you're weak, he's strong. So this is like men's wisdom. You know, God makes men's wisdom look foolish, right? What's that verse? Uh, the, the wisdom of man is foolishness to God or something like that. Um but literally, like in our minds, it makes no sense to go into a situation unprepared. But in God's direction, that is the exact place he wants you to be so that you know and everyone else knows that it is not you doing this. It's all him. You know, he gets the glory. He's already got this planned out. You don't have to worry about anything. It's not like he didn't rescue you so you could be part of his team because he needs your, you know, he needs your giftings. He just needs a vessel that's willing to do it. And that's all about, that's what the freedom's for. You need to empty yourself out so you can use the entire vessel, right? Not just little pieces here and there. He doesn't just need your finger. He needs your entire arm. He wants your entire torso, you know? He wants all that. So as you go through this process of refinement and you're walking in, into sanctification and all that stuff, you're cleaning out a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then eventually, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to be an image of Christ, Right. And all these lies that the enemy tells you, they are imagination. So the verse in Second Corinthians 10, right, casting down imaginations and everything that sets itself above Christ, the image of Christ. Right. We were all predestined to be conformed into his image. So that's what this is about. Conformity. Well, the if truth is, the, yeah. the real truth is, is it's already complete. It is. It's already been done. Right. Been done. We're just catching up. Like yeah. it's already, God doesn't start a work that he is not going to complete, right? He is, he is the creator of all things. And he created you and chose you with the specific intention of making you an image bearer of God, right? You may not look like it right now, but he is not, he has your entire life to work that out, right? Yeah. So, he, he starts something. He's faithful and true to, for, to finish it through, right? Right. And the lie is, is that you're not good enough. You're not there. You're not this. No, the thing is, is we are, we are human and in the aspect that we only see things in a linear timeline one second at a time one minute at a time one day at a time one year at a time right that god has already seen the whole thing the lie is that you're not good enough right now the thing is 
you are you are a complete work in God's eyes, right? He's working on you right now. That is the whole point. And we can, you know, that is a lie of Satan that you that you are not good enough. You are not there. This is who you are. This you'll always be this way. That's all crap, right? That is a lie of Satan because God is working on you right now. That means He is molding you. He's shaping you. He's changing you. That is where we need to be at, right? Um, one of the other things we talked about. Um, uh, so you were saying like you know. Well, you know, I, I need to do this or I need to do that. See, we talked about David a couple weeks ago where we were talking about which one was it? Was it struggles or? Uh, David was uh, destiny, character right, destiny. destiny, right? It actually so, bled, it bled over into every week so far. <laughs> well, because it's very important, especially yeah. when we're talking about this. So David was told that he was going to be king, but you didn't see him go and run off and do, you know, and say, oh, I need to learn this. And I had to learn this. He went back to what he was doing for 15 years mm -hmm. and God trained him and taught him. So we always talk about this, like, you know, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, well, I have to do this. Or if I want to get into ministry, I'm going to have to go to seminary school or whatever. Yeah. You need to be asking God what part of the body you are, because an eyeball doesn't need to know how to grip. Well, sometimes right? you don't even need to know what kind of body part you are, because sometimes that will lead you to uh, trying to do that yourself. Right. You know? Right. But tell like God, you're, you're an God eyeball, and you're like, oh, praise God, I'm an eyeball. Right. And then you're going out like trying to ask people what eyeballs do. Uh, what does an eyeball in the kingdom look like? And then you try to form yourself to that. God has a unique purpose for you. You know, you don't, first and foremost, what we want you to know is that you're a you're a warrior, and this is a war, and you need to act like this is a war. And that's what we're trying to do. We're help try to help you see that this is a there. You're in a war right now. There's nothing more to think about than warfare. Right. You know, that's yeah. it. You need the understanding know. that there is a battle going on every day. When your second job is what you, you know, that's your second job. You know, you're like, even, so every soldier, even back in the Civil War, you know, they got like the little flute player guy, right? He's still a warrior. He's still on the battlefield. He's just a flute player. <laughs> he has another <laughs> mission. That would suck, by the way. I would never say yes to that. These dudes, those dudes, they need to write books about those guys. Those guys are <laughs> courageous dudes, man. So uh, you're like, heading on that, heading oh, on that part. I man. got one. Uh, First Peter 2.11, for anybody that's following along. Um, Beloved, I urge you, aliens and strangers, to abstain from fresh, fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Right. So this is exactly what we're talking about. These are battles that are happening on our outside of our walls and inside of our own walls, right? Yep. Um, did you have anything else? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just no, didn't want to forget right. that. <laughs> so the next part I want to talk about, we've talked about a couple of these other sections, but the next part I want to talk about is Trojan horses. This is something I don't think is covered enough, right? It's things that we think are perfectly okay that we we let in our gates, right? Thinking, well, this, you know, this could be from God, right? It's, you know, whatever. And it turns out that it's full of the enemy, right? Um, I've had experiences like this, a personal experience. So I talked about um, somebody who I was with that hadn't had um, an, a, aborted a kid that maybe was mine. I don't even know. Um, but that was really devastating to my spirit at the time. But during that time, God had told me specifically to wait. And I, you know, he said that there was going to be, you're going to have a family soon. Didn't say I was going to have a wife. Didn't say whatever. He said I was going to have a family. That's when my son came. He told me to wait six months. And I completely disregarded that when the first girl uh, came came along who I was attracted to. I mean, I fell in lust with her. Um, and there was just a lot of complications that happened with that relationship that really were devastating to my soul. But I thought, well, this is this is clearly who God, you know, sent my way. Right. This is this is perfect. Right. And what it was, was a, you know, a package that was put in my path to basically, you know, tried to devastate me. I mean, I got to the point with that relationship where I was drinking an entire bottle of Jack out on my porch and my friends came and checked on me. They're like, dude, are you okay? Like, I mean, it was terrible. I mean, that situation was awful, but that was something that I thought I tried to justify and say, well, this is what he's talking about, right? This is going to be fine, right? There were a lot of things that happened like that, that we have to be really careful with. And, and back to like the drugs, you know, and using those to get in, um, another option, another thing that we talk about um, is there's a lot of spirituality or spiritualism that's happening in Christianity today. Ouija boards, tarot card readings, things like that. If you have had any of that kind of stuff in your life, it's no different than the DMT stuff. Um, I was in the paranormal field for years. I, I still need to add that to my testimony. Um, I ran a paranormal group for a long time. And one of the scary things that people, this was bit back when like ghost hunters and everything was real popular. 
I felt God calling me to do something about it. And I was actually writing in a paranormal horror magazine and I was writing things like the ghost hunters prayer and the dangers of the paranormal because I was trying to, to get people to not think that this is a joke because I went to some of the most haunted places in, in, in the world. And with my understanding of the way spirit, the, the life and death cycle works, there should not be a three-year-old kid saying help or come talk to me. Right. That is, demonic and anybody who this is another way like we're talking about with the trojan horse when if you were going into the ghost hunter things and then you know there's this entity that's talking to you it sounds like a little kid i still have videos on my 317 paranormal uh where we went to waverly hills in louisville, louisville kentucky and there's known this little kid on timmy at waverly hills you can clearly hear him say he wants to play with us and that's not a little kid, right? That is a that is that is a gate that is the Trojan horse. That demon has been waiting there for you to come and take it home with you. <laughs> so all he wants to do is make it sound like, "Hey, I'm 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 a cute little kid. Come talk to me. Come play with me. Come let me in your gates." Right? And that's where the, another Trojan horse. The same thing can happen with, you know, oh, well you know, dear old auntie wants to talk to me through the Ouija board. That's not your aunt, right? When you die or your, you know, your friend or family member died and they had demons that were with them from, you know, their entire life, that demon knows everything about them. They're going to tell well, you. familiar spirit. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, those are Trojan horses. Those are things that we need to stay away from. The Bible says anybody who is dealing, you know, in, in witchcraft, in sorcery, and speaking to the dead, like those are abominations to God. You you should not be messing around with those kind of things because they can be tro Trojan horses. And I know a lot of people who got into that aspect of it and then started having visions of Mary and angels and all kinds of stuff. And they were not godly. They were teaching, they were getting taught gospels of demons, right? From these entities that they were communicating with. So that's another thing we have to be really careful. There's a whole list of of things that we can count as Trojan horses, which you can you can be trapped in. There are there are entire denominations of Christianity. There are um, the theological traps that you know get you into this whole idea of not trusting anybody and you know getting yourself as far away from sin and everything. And it, you're way out in the middle of like I've said many times, you're way out in the middle of left field by yourself. You have no protection. There are no walls there. Are, you, you've left. You just, you, you are not anywhere in any safe area. You have out, you've chased Gnosticism and, and the search for knowledge out in the middle of nowhere and you have no protection, right? These are things that we really have to be careful because we need to be in the stronghold of Yahweh. We need to be guarded and protected and we need to stay away from things that are going to open up doors. Um, and I think most of the people that are that are watching right now are aware of this, but I know there might be some people that are coming along that may not know this. But there are even in Christianity, there are th trains of thought that can open up demons into your life. <clears throat> and one of these is a false religious spirit. It looks very Christian. It sounds very Christian, but it's what we call the Kundalini spirit. Um, and it is it mirrors exactly what the, the Kundalini uh, yogis um, were, were involved in and it is passed. I personally believe through laying on hands. Um, I've seen it take over an entire church, you know, where, where one person brings it in and they want to pray for everybody. And, and then all of a sudden everybody else, you, they're submitting to somebody else's prayer and they're opening themselves up to, because they think, well, you know, this is godly, you know, right. This person just wants to pray for me and they submit to somebody. That's the whole thing. Like, you have to be careful with the Bible says to be careful who you lay your well, hands on. I think on. that's a, the problem there. One of the problems there is, you know, uh, there's two two lines of churches, right? There's two lines of Christianity. There's the one that's that's seeks to have relationship and know their father. The other one seeks to be the you know to know their father, like the knowledge of God, right? This is the same choice, right? They know of God, but they don't know Him. Right, they know him as a religious, you know, uh, in the in the form of a, a religious type thing. And then the other thing is too, like, if you have, um, say, you were a, a child and you you were abused as a child by your father. Okay, so you have a really poor, or maybe you don't even have a father, and you have a poor um, idea of what a father looks like. And maybe you approach God as the father, like you would your father. You assume, 
you ever seen like those statues where like it'll show God real big and then like the little people or it'll the man upstairs, he's like this big God and he's sitting up on the clouds and we're all peons, you know, like that can shape your mindset uh, and form this image of God. That's not, that's not correct. Right. But it shapes the way that you act towards him. Uh, so you, you would come, you wouldn't bring to him certain things without feeling um, like you're not worthy. Right. We always try to feel like we're worthy. Like, I'm not going to pray for that because I'm not worthy of that. You know, that's not what the Bible says, man. That, that's the whole point. That's why you have these denomination shifts because they don't actually know God. They know about God. They know of God. They know his things that he's done, but they don't know him. Right. And that's the, that's the thing. You don't need to know a lot of this stuff. He wants you to know him. When you know him, his laws become easy. His burden becomes light, right? It, it is light, but it, it looks heavy now. But that's because you know of it. You don't know him. You know, you know what I'm saying? When you know somebody and you do things from this loving perspective, like I want him to be happy. You know, I want to do the things that he likes because it makes him happy. That's why you do it. You don't do it to protect yourself from being spanked or get his wrath. You know, you don't do it out of fear. You do it out of love. Absolutely. Sorry, I was just trying to pull this back up here. <laughs> oh, you're cool. Um, so go a little bit. I know we kind of talked about all this. We've talked about how the enemy gets in. We're, we're talking about kicking the enemy out. Now, I want to give some people some tools that they might still be struggling with stuff. They might like try to be figuring out like where where am I at? How do I get rid of this? Right. Um, so I got this little thing here. It says. We were not born as believers in Yahweh. For most of our lives, we journey. Our journeys included some form of un unrighteousness. This unrighteousness can remain as a stronghold in our lives. A few examples are addiction, sexual sin, um, or evil speech, which includes gossip, negativity, um, or even crude language. Um, if this stronghold remains, we will be easily tempted in these areas and suffer defeat often. All right, these are a few possibilities for these remaining strongholds, even for believers. Uh, one, you may not really have repented of the sin. Sometimes we repent of sin, but we do the same thing again. Was that true repentance? True repentance is to turn away from that sin. So there's a lot of times when, you know, you do something, you're like, oh, my God, why did I do that? I don't want to do this anymore. Right. But then the next time it comes up, it's like, why did I do that? Right. It's like with smoking. I, I always compare this to smoking because I tried so many times to quit smoking. That's something God is dealing with me um, as well. Um because I can I can fill in a lot of these things with just smoking alone. I can say, well, I have ADD or ADHD, and my my aunt, who is a doctor, always said, well, you use smoking as to self medicate because it does help me focus. And so right. my excuse is, well, I smoke because so I can focus, right? But, yeah, I'm. Yeah, <laughs> dude, it's right? so, so crazy. I know some I know of the stuff you say about you know I use smoke. People would be like, man, I. Don't you have asthma? I'm like, yeah. Actually, I smoke menthol, so it actually helps my asthma. They're like, what? <laughs> right, so <there's> <laughs> it's not true, people. man. I feel I'm telling you right now, there's a super big lie that I believe because I literally I haven't smoked in two months now. I feel better than I ever have. And it, it's yeah, it's a total lie. Even if, no matter how well you feel while you're smoking, and right. you think that. <laughs> I don't know what you, I don't even know how I believe some of this stuff, but so I, had, I had several times, I had several times when I, when I was like, I'm quitting, I'm, I'm going to quit. And the next time that I was cognizant, I had already went in to the gas station, bought a pop, grabbed a snack, grabbed a pack of cigarettes. And I was sitting in the truck smoking a cigarette from it. I thought it was quitting. Yeah. Right? We do that a lot of times with sin, right? Or you go, you quit and you're like, I got seven cigarettes left. I'm going to quit right after that. But then yeah. subconsciously, when you're down to two, you hit the gas station right. and you're in there buying it. And then you're like, well, I'm not going to turn around and put it back now. This is weird. Or, yeah, this you know, is and I'm, like, I'm just going to wait until <laughs> I've told my wife, too. I'm like, I'm serious. I'm quitting. She's like, you have three packs inside. You want me to throw them away? I'm like, no, do not throw no, them no, away. No. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. You can't wait. That. Oh, it's yeah. Like, heck no, man. I'll give, them to, I'll give them to somebody. <laughs> Um, Carol, or I'm sorry, uh, Carissa was asking about um, mine is on Omega Chronicles TV. Um, uh, Ian, where, where did, where's your testimony at? Man, I am, there's, there's a couple, but none of them are like all the way. Cause we run out of time every time. And, and 
you can see one. I'm not even sure how to. I guess you could probably just look my name up and look up Now You See TV. It's from 2017, and it was when Disputed Lands was on Now You See TV. You can find that one. Um, then there's one that I did on Revolutionary Radio. Or, or is it Revolution Radio? Is that the one Robbie Davidson's on? Or is that something else? Celebrate uh, Truth Radio? Rob, Rob, yeah. Celebrate, Celebrate Truth, Truth Radio? Says Rob. Celebrate Truth. Rob. Yeah. It might be on Re Re Revelation Radio, too. I don't know. Revolution <laughs> Radio? Revelation? This is Rob, why Robbie did. Davidson uh, and, and Nate Wolf had me on the show. It's a podcast, though. This is um, why but, you need a secretary, because you need somebody to oh, organize Oh, man, all yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, well, I see, my plan is this year, coming soon, my wife and I would like to share our testimonies, and we're going to do like a um, – where we sit down, and we're going to actually film it with good cameras, and it won't be like video chat style. It will be – it will be nice and, and done right because we would like to be able to yeah my wife and I are edit it up a little bit too I think it's important that every couple do that you know try to record their story together because I have a I have a testimony she has a testimony but then we came together and we yeah. have this testimony together that I never even get to because I'm you know too busy leading you up to that point and then we kind of like run out of time and yeah my wife, like, oh, my see wife you later. Has an incredible story too and yeah I mean, she's just not one that like you know, I'm like, hey, how would you tell your story? She's like, I don't know. Right, that's same with my <laughs> wife. She's like, you know, plus, plus we have five kids, so right. uh, finding time to sit and talk is hard. Let alone set up a camera and be like, kids, leave us alone for long enough to film this thing. So we're right. kind of like, it's on the back burner. We need it to be on the front burner, but honestly, it's, you know, we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make it happen, though. Um, if anything, I'm gonna redo mine. And put it out uh, just because I would rather I need to have my own testimony on my own channel. You know, that's why I think I think it's important. I think it's really important. It's like one of the main things, because to be to be honest with you, I, 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 I mean. What kicked off all of this for me, as far as all the relationships, I have so many friends now. Um, through like now you see TV and take on the world and all these different people that I've met in the last two years, three years now or whatever it is. I would have never met any of those people had I not been obedient and shared my testimony the first time I was asked to, yeah. you know, if I wouldn't, and even though I didn't picture that, he just said, share your testimony. If I wouldn't have said, okay. And I would have just sat there and been like, if I do this, what's it going to look like? You know, like what's going to happen after? Is it going to be like this? Should I should I push this part of my testimony in hopes to like land a gig? You know, like you know, in that area. No, you just be faithful, and God will literally. He has a use. He just wants to see if you're obedient. You cannot like I, literally. So at the time when I first shared my my testimony, I'd been coming into truth, right? I'd been understanding Torah and understanding this this concept that the laws is you know as we knew it being done away with is not is not what the scripture actually says and all that stuff. And I pretty much was alone. Like I didn't have any fellowship, right? No local fellowship, no nothing. And the online stuff was foreign to me at the time. I didn't really do any of that. Only thing I was a part of was virtual house church and stuff like that, that I had found. Um, but one of my prayers at the time was for fellowship. And then once I shared that testimony online, I got blessed with more fellowship than I need. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was like a crazy way. I never thought it would happen that way. I was I was praying and expecting it to be local, but it came in another form, which is across the airwaves and stuff. But it is so much more unique and tighter community-wise than I've had before in local settings. So it's God answers your prayer, and it's it, – and a lot of times it's not the way you think he's going to. And he just asks that you be obedient to him. That's all he asks. Yeah. You can't even plan it sometimes how he does it, you know, <laughs> so much better than the way you thought it. So I don't all even right, know sorry. how to end it from here, but <laughs> I, I've still got a ton more. To oh man, we're good. <laughs> I'll try to, I'll try to rush through. I, I just want to cover these, especially. Yeah, go for um, it. So this was the, the four, the four things. Cause I, I kind of stopped at one. So one, 
you may not have, have repented of the sin. Sometimes we repent of sin, but then do the same thing again. Was that truly repentance? True repentance is to turn away from sin. Two, you may not believe that Yahweh has forgiven you. If you don't accept Yahweh's forgiveness, Satan will use this to accuse you continuously. You will feel defeated and will be weak and resistant to temptation. Or, yeah, weak to resist temptation. Three, you may have, or see, let's see, you may not have forgiven yourself. This is a big one um, where God, you, you went to God for forgiveness and then you just don't, you don't forgive yourself. You're still holding on to the sin. Um, you may have not forgiven yourself as in the case of not accepting Yahweh's forgiveness. If you have not forgiven yourself, you will also be accused by Satan. You will feel defeated and weak to temptation. He is using this to rule over your life. Another reason is that you think you are strong enough to resist temptation and allow yourself to be where you could be tempted. We are taught to flee from sin. This is something that Jeremiah Dirt talked about um, in last week's broadcast. As we think, sometimes you think, well, no, I can, you know, I can, I can handle it, right? I can, you know, if you got a problem with pornography and you're going to a strip club, you're like, uh, you know, it's not a big deal, right? Yeah, we're not touching there, doing yeah, anything. I, I can see a, you know, I can see. I can look at them. I'm a grown man. I can see it if I want. I can restrain myself. Yeah, you can't. So those are four four things. If you're still struggling, you know, need to start looking at and say, you know, are these things that I can deal with? When we talk about, uh, let's see, 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, flee immorality. Every other sin that man commits is outside of the body, but the uh, immoral man sins against his own body. We're talking about an internal war here, right? Um, 2 Timothy 2.22, now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on Yahweh from a pure heart, right? So that's stop surrounding yourself with people of the world. You know, like if you're struggling with something, don't, you know, if you're, if you're a meth addict, don't go hang out with all your meth head buddies, right? Go, yeah. go to church, you know, go find some people. Yeah, that you got to change your environment for sure. <sighs> yeah. Listen to this. Here's the, here's one. First Corinthians 10 31 whatsoever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all in the glory to the glory of God for the glory of God, right? Whatever your translation says. But if you think about that, like we talked about last week, you read these verses and you, you're like, that's a good verse, but you, you like pass right over it. Like, yeah, I do everything to the glory of God. Yeah. And then you don't like, if you think about that, it, how many of us can look at our lives and what we do every day and think everything I did, I did for the glory of God. God get I want God to get glory in everything I do because a lot of times some of these strongholds in our lives are not even like you would never even see them coming the Trojan horses right like your free time that you like and, and it's broken up so you know so small increments here where you've got tons of little things that you do just for a small amount of time but you have time struggling to do your devotions every morning or to pray for longer than 15 minutes you know because your day's full of stuff, right? Not that we don't have responsibilities and things that we have to do, but time management is like a huge thing because that could be a stronghold for you for sure. Like I, I gave up fantasy football and it opened up. I can't even believe the time that it opened up in my life. I didn't even see that coming, man. I was just thinking God's telling me not to watch or to play fantasy football. It's probably because it's gambling. And I used to justify it and say, it's a job. I'm really good at it. Like it's a skill. It's not like gambling. You only win if you're good type of thing. It's not like, you know, whatever it was. But when I said no to fantasy, I didn't realize that it. I, I literally would have no desire to watch football or listen to the podcasts that go along with making my fantasy lineup and all that stuff. It literally gave me so much free time. But then, like we said before, where you, when you remove these strongholds, uh, you have a void and you have to make sure to fill that void with something, something for the glory of God. Right. So I began to listen to podcasts in the place of those fantasy podcasts. I'd listen to, you know, different sermons or um, get an audio book. Um, like one of the good audio books I just listened to is uh, uh, P.D. Vander Westhausen, Reigniting Spirit and Truth. I've listened to it twice now. It's super good. Or you can get Nathan Reynolds' book and uh, Snatch from the Flames and listen to that one multiple times, whatever you got to do. But like these are little things that you can do to start changing yourself. And you start to, you know, when you start to fill your time with reading the promises and hearing the positive and 
all that stuff, it will literally change your steps, right? It changes the way, the direction that your life is going in. It brings it back around. Instead of this, instead of just being like, man, I watch, I have to like unwind because every parent un unwinds, man. I used to unwind with video games and movies every night and beer, yeah. you know, and now I don't have to. I don't have to. And you, you know, not that video games and beer are bad or even movies. It's no, just it's, in. You don't want them to be. You don't want them to be the idol or become an idol or become right. a stronghold or something. So, you know, being like, this is like the concept of fasting, right? So when you go without food, it's to enhance your spirit, man, right? It's not, you don't go without food for the rest of your life. You just do it to make sure that you can do it. You're strengthening this inner man and being able to tell your fleshly body no on some right. things that you enjoy, right? You're saying, not right now. I'm taking a break. And mm -hmm. when you use that, you build these muscles, right, that help you make it through the struggle, which we talked about. The struggle is good. You just have to learn to manage it. Yeah. And at first John two fifteen, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. So the things of the world can be strongholds too. material things, a career status, all these things become strongholds. If we put our trust in it, another way to develop a stronghold in your life is to spend too much time with ungodly people doing ungodly things like, you know, so yeah, things of the world can be, can become strongholds because we put them before God. Right. And they, they can, be an issue that God has to deal with and get them out of your life. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I know you, we want to hammer this out real quick, but I, I want to give people biblical scriptures on how to deal with and break down strongholds. So we want to break down every stronghold. God is going to, as he's going through that refining process, he is going to bring things up in your life, things that probably you've swept under the rug a long time ago, but the enemy has burrowed himself in, you know, like for instance, my dad, um, he was a really short guy and, uh, like four, nine, he had, a, a like a form of dwarfism. Um, and he was dealt with rejection in his family. Uh, you know, his, his mom was married seven different times. His dad didn't really want anything to do with him. His sister was from another, uh, you know, another dad or whatever. I, there was just so much going on there and his, the parent or his mom couldn't deal with him. They sent him off to boys school and all throughout his life because it was his, disability, he dealt with rejection. So it took him, he was 30, around 30 years old when he found God and, and went through deliverance. So it, he had 30 years of rejection and it almost took 30 more years to get that all cleaned out. Right. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm having a hard time grasping what you're saying. Are you saying your dad was a dwarf? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's four, nine. My sister's five, four, 11. Yeah, and I'm six three. I know. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is like the craziest thing ever. I was yeah. like, did he? I'm like, I'm listening to your thing. And I'm like, did he just say his dad is dwarf? Yeah, yeah. Did my, you, it, you're it, like a Viking. I know it affects That's sanity. It, it, and your mom's because, not tall either, really. No, you know? my grandparents on both sides of my family were really tall, and you know, I, I have. Scandinavian heritage. So it's, that's where the Viking look comes from, but I had a 50, 50 shot. My sister got it. I didn't. So, but, uh, yeah, my dad was a, <laughs> my dad was a bodybuilder. I mean, he was, he was a badass. I mean, he beat his own record in the state for like powerlifting 500 pounds. I mean, he was, when you just said he beat his own record in state, it reminded me of uncle Rico. <laughs> yeah. If I can go back in time, I take state, <laughs> but he dealt with, he dealt with a lot of issues. Um, that's where his anger and stuff came from, from the rejection that he dealt with. And it took, you know, 30 yeah. years and he struggled with it for another 30 years. He died um, a few years ago when I think it was in his uh, late 60s. Um, but he had a lot of medical problems and things like that. I, um, I can't remember what the, the guy's name is or uh, something white or right. Uh, Henry Wright. Does that sound right? He's uh, he's he, he has a book where he talks about. Um, how resentment and anger and things like that can affect you physically. It yeah, actually they manifest, shows, yeah, they manifest yeah. in like physical sickness and ailments. And he had, he dealt with a lot of those things and, and it took because I mean, any, that's another thing I wanted to touch on was pride, which I, I wrote down a little bit of stuff on that too, but he dealt with a lot of self-made pride. It was a lot of things that, you know, he had to be a badass because people, you know, if people picked on him. He would just go kick their ass, you know, like that was just kind of how it was. Um, but God was using his ailments to humble him. By the time 
He, I mean, because he he had times where he was bipolar. He had times where he was very angry, and if he was diabetic. He had, um, uh, I mean, he would just fly off the handle sometimes, and he would just be extremely violent. And you know, you know, anything could set him off at any time. He had high blood pressure. I mean, things were just like that. But by the end of his life, where through all of the ailments and stuff, where he had kidney failure and and had to go to dialysis three times a, a week, all of that humbled him to a point he was completely. I mean he was a completely different man by the end of that. I mean, it was, it, it was God using all of those things to like repair all of the damage that was done to his spirit throughout his life. So there are a lot of things that we struggle with are things that we've not only brought onto ourselves, but things that have happened to us in our childhood. I mean, we talked about a lot of these, so, but we want to break down every stronghold, right? Um, right. Second Corinthians 10, three through five says, for though we walk in flesh, we do not war according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh but divinely power, powerful for the destruction of fortresses we are destroying speculations and every loft every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of elohim we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of the messiah right yeah so look at six though look at verse six in my translation it says and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Correct. Yep. That's super cool. You know? Um, and so another, another thing is um, in Ephesians, um, which I know a lot of people, we, we've talked about this being a war and we talk about the armor of God, but understanding that now you understand you're warring in your own little village, right? Your own, right. and you have to understand what the armor means, right? So um, Ephesians 6, 13 through 18 says, therefore, we take up full armor of Elohim so that you will be able to resist the evil, uh, the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet for the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all taking up the shield of faith, which will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all of the saints. Right. So this is telling you, you need to have the shield, right? Because the enemy is going to be launching arrows at you. These are those lies that the devil, these fiery arrows that the devil you know, sends at you. And we need to attack back with the word. Right. That's the sword, the sword of uh, the sword of the spirit. Right. So we need to have righteousness. We need to stand firm. We need to have the gospel of peace. We need to have um, the helmet of salvation. Right. That protects our brain. Right. It, it, that protects the enemy from attacking our thoughts, our, our brain, our process. Right. Mm -hmm. So each one of these is important. And, and that's something if you are really questioning or struggling with something, keep going back to Ephesians that that and, and go where is the enemy attacking me at? Like, what do I need to be working on? What piece of armor do I need to be working on? You know? Um, so that's like really important. We need to be in that mindset that this is a war. This is, this is a battle and this is a battle internally as yeah. well as externally. Well, sometimes too, like I, one of the things I was going to say as like a, a tip, uh, my wife started doing this and I, you know, it's so funny is like a, my wife started putting note cards up, right? She started writing verses down for specific things for herself, not for me necessarily, but uh, things that she needed work on. She, she was trying to focus on uh, being more alert and more attentive to certain things uh, as a spiritual warfare situation and not just uh, whatever else, like a normal thing, mainly having to do with kids behavior and her reactions to that. But she would put these up places like in the, in the mirror, in the bathroom and on the fridge and by the stove and on the microwave and on this and on that. And then like, you know, it would be a reminder as she walked by to see these things. And I, my mom used to do the same exact thing. I couldn't remember. And my mom actually came to visit and she's like, oh my gosh, I love your note cards. And then she gave my wife note cards <laughs> from when I was a kid. Like, here are the ones I used. Like who awesome. saves that? But Yeah. Anyway, she saved that stuff. But then, you know, I, so I take it for granted because I see it all the time and I never do it. But recently I started doing that. So I wrote down some stuff and because I'm in my car a lot. I drive for work and I do some other things. I would put them on, you know, in the dash or in my where my coffee goes in the middle console there. And, it, and then I would. Well, what's different is I don't just look at it. 
and read it in my mind, I say it out loud, right? So declaring these things and, and little by little, you're feeding your spirit. You're strengthening your core, right? Um, that's what you need to do is just begin to do that. Because you have all this outside force from the entire culture is set against you and your success and, and everything the Lord wants for you. It's everything is neutral. That's not what God wants, right? He doesn't want passive. He wants aggressive, right? And and he wants you to believe that you're more than a conqueror by the power of the Holy Spirit and that you need to set your feet to do his will. And whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are good, honest, and pure, those things, you need to think on those things all the time. Constantly be preparing your mind and setting yourself uh, apart from the from these worldly things, repairing the breach, right? Fortify your walls. Right. So we you start that with little stones. You don't come in and bring a crane and drop down this huge, you know, border wall. You yeah. you literally start putting, like you said before, repentance is a mortar. So like these little things every or forgiveness, yeah, forgiveness yeah. is mortar. As you start to do these things, you know, it, these little things, there's lots of mortar, I believe. There's lots of different things. And you're just kind of slapping stones on there. And, you know, and if yeah. something, you know, you know, sometimes you have to tear some things down and rebuild it. Yeah. You know. So, yeah, I got one more thing to talk about and then the conclusion. <laughs> so okay. pride. So now we kind of got the idea about how the whole thing is laid out, right? We have this castle in the middle. Yahweh is our is the castle our in the middle, right? Yahweh is in the middle. We have this protection and refuge in Him. We have this wall that's exterior. Now, what pride does um, is, is the trust in self and pride, right? So mm -hmm. these these uh, like pride and, and and trusting in ourselves to do things and to do things our way, right? Those can be strongholds as well. Strongholds we build, right? We yeah. think we're going to fortify ourselves. We don't need God, right? Yeah. We're going to build our own fortification, right? Yeah. So these things. Can I be only watch Game of Thrones on Saturdays. <laughs> you know. Um, but it says these things can be strongholds in our lives. When we trust in ourselves, we cannot trust Yahweh. Pride causes us, among other things, to be unteachable and not willing to admit error. This is a hindrance to us and to Yahweh. Right. So instead of doing the what, what God intended us to do and have a stronghold, a retreat that we can go into, we have built our own stronghold and it will not stand up to the attacks of the enemies. We're not retreating to the one who built the city in the first place. Right. The one who can truly protect us. We're, we're like, no, I've got this. I need to do this. I, I'm going to do this. Right. Pride is the sin that caused uh, Hasatan to fall. Right. Pride is the like what causes the biggest issues <clears throat> in not only um possession but oh uh but oppression um when when we when we have if you find yourself in a situation i know like at my point in my life when i walked away when i had my prodigal son moment that was because i was not patient enough to wait for god i was going to do it my own way that's pride mm -hmm. and that unleashed all of the problems that i had in that time frame and when it, everything came crumbling down, I went, all right, God, look, I messed up. I built all of this. I'm not going to blame you, right? Mm -hmm. So I need you to help me build this because I already tried it and I failed miserably, right? I had that understanding. But when you have a prideful heart, there is nothing going to tell you that, you know, not even God himself is going to tell you you're wrong, right? So that's mm -hmm. another thing that we deal with is pride is taking away God's protection from that and saying, well, I'm going to protect this whole situation myself. When you barely understand the war, when you barely understand that what the enemy has burrowed under your gates, that he's penetrated your walls, and you think you're going to defend it by yourself, that's ridiculous. You are going to be under constant and a nonstop onslaught and attack. Yeah, or you think that you're going to, you don't want to tell anybody, you're going to find a way to do it yourself because, or you're going to find a way to do it without telling people the truth, right? right? right. Without coming completely clean. Like I'll tell people that I smoke and I'll tell people that I, you know, struggle with, uh, you know, um, I don't read my Bible all the time or, you know, whatever, but I'm not telling them about porn or I'm not going to tell them about, they don't need to know that part. Right. They, they, they can, 
the other two are bad enough, right? I'll get it fixed without having to go all the way. Secret sins are the worst because they are, dude, and they're they're the yeah. ones that you hide from everybody. You're not only hide you're you're trying to hide them from God. You're trying to hide them from your spouse. You're trying to hide them from everyone else in the world. So you have those spirits, those entities that are oppressing you or possessing you, which whatever side of the fence you're on, there they literally can go unchecked. There is nobody that is going to tell you hey, what you're doing is wrong because it's secret. You don't let anybody know. It's a skeleton in your closet. So that is something that you have to get those things out. You well, have the, the other thing is too, is like, so if the enemy, his only goal is, uh, well, it's not his only goal, but his only tool is to lie to you, right? He can lie and dis dissuade you and um, persuade you the wrong direction, things like that. But he tells you, he, he shames you, right? Uses your shame and all that. Well, how do you break that, right? What, what do we talk about in the mainstream media when we're like, we want whistleblowers to come out, right? We're praying for whistleblowers to come forward and tell this information, right? Tell everybody what's really going on with sex trafficking and with, you know, pet, pornog or pedophilia and all this stuff in Hollywood and all this stuff in D.C. We want whistleblowers to come out and tell us. I mean, that means th that we want people that do this stuff that are involved in this stuff to come out and, and come clean. But no one's doing it. No one's coming clean. You know what I mean? Because they're they're held in shame. Like I can't say that I don't want to tell what's going on because I've been a part of this, you know, and they're mm -hmm. held in shame. But that's also our fault because as the church, the real church, we're supposed to be showing love to these people. We're supposed to have this loving safety net for these people because our, we were shown grace and, you know, we should be showing grace to them in situations like that. But yet we're not. We're out here praying specifically for justice, you know. And God is the Avenger, right? We should be loving these people. And like we said last week, real love is praying and blessing your enemies. We're not, if you're not doing that. You're doing it wrong. You know what I mean? Like that's a huge thing in itself. I, there's so many points that we brought up that are like we just throw them all together. Like, yeah, there's all, this is all you got to do. This literally like is a lifetime's worth of work if you're trying to do it. You know, like you you need help. You need the father's assistance. Yep. And you don't have to try to put it in, in your own order. If you love him and you try to just strive to work and do one day at a time, that's what it's about. One day at a time. Don't think like, if I start doing this now, five years from now, I'll be clean. Or six months from now, I'll be clean. Just try to do it tomorrow. That's it. One Don't worry about, yeah, tomorrow, do the mana principle, right? I got to wake up. I got to make it till tomorrow night when I lay my head on my pillow. I'm going to thank God that I made it one day. And yeah. he's going to charge you up and get you ready for the next day. And you don't have to worry about the day after that, or, you know, you just literally try to get your mind focused on tomorrow's the day, right? Kingdom of God is now. Yeah. There is no tomorrow. Right. Yeah. That's one thing I've always liked to, like to tell people is like the, our concept of time is all perception based anyways. I don't know anybody who's, I, I, I you remember when you were in school, right. And you did hear that clock ticking. Uh-huh. And 15 minutes yeah, would feel like three I hours. Do speed drills. Remember speed drills? I couldn't do this. Because, like, <laughs> stupid clock in the background it's messing me all up. Yeah. So, I mean, time is the percent, the whole concept of time is only relevant to this earth, this sphere, this reality. And it's swayed by each, each different person. Cause I don't know how many times I've had something I really wanted to do and it goes by so quick, but then it's the same time period. Three hours could seem like if it's something I don't want to do can seem like an eternity. Right. But the thing I always like to tell people is tomorrow is already passed or tomorrow or yesterday is already passed. You, there's nothing you can do to change it. And tomorrow never comes. We only live in today. Tomorrow is a concept. It's an idea. We actually only live second to second. Right. Yeah, That's and why we're going to do. We're going to do a series on tomorrow never comes. And we're going to literally just talk about 007 all day. <laughs> but I mean, Unless tomorrow never dies. It, it, I mean, oh, tomorrow's that's never the exact guaranteed. opposite. Then. That's the that's the way the enemy attacks you. Is tomorrow never dies. You always have this promise of tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be better, but tomorrow never comes. Yeah, but the Bible, the Bible oh, says gosh, I blew my own mind. <laughs> the Bible says that, you know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. Right. We don't have 
there's no guarantee that our our you can say, well, I'll do all these things tomorrow. I'll go talk yeah, to that person. Is, isn't that is it in Mark or Matthew or that story of the rich man when he's like, he has so much stuff, he builds new barns to store all of his stuff in it, right? And then he dies. He dies and then God <laughs> says, "Tonight your life is required of you." Yeah, and it's all gone. I mean, you know, he, like. The, my dad used to say all the time, he said, you can't take it with you. So we yeah. have all this stuff, but when you die, what are they going to do? Stuff it in the grave with you? Yeah. I got something planned, some video planned with this exact message. You're going to like it. It's going to be cool. Do a like, <laughs> all right. Let me finish up. Oh, Last thing is, and we can, because I don't want people to think, right? That this is a war, right? But the side that we're on, the creator that we have loves us and sent yeah. his son to set us free, right? So I don't want to leave. Like, this is a battle, you're on your own, blah, 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 right? No. Yeah. All right. So we all have strongholds. Our strongholds are, are we all have strongholds or strongholds are in our lives. We, uh, we may be held captive by it. However, we are not in despair. Yahweh has given us the authority and power through Yeshua to overcome and be free from strongholds in our lives. Yah <clears throat> Yahweh's truth, which is Yeshua, the living word, and his written word, and is all we need, right? Um, it was pro it was prophesied that uh, Yeshua would would set his captives free. Um, in Isaiah 61, 1, it says, The Spirit of Yahweh Elohim is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has set me to bind up or to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Yeah. And Ye Yeshua, when he came and was in the synagogue, he he proclaimed this, said, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim to release the captives, recover sight to the blind and set free to those who are oppressed. Yeah. Right. So God loves us, right? That, that is the biggest thing with him. He, he loves us. And there might be this battle and this war going on, but he is in control of this whole thing. We need to rest and, and go to him and, and flee from the enemy. When you, when you 180 from the enemy, just imagine that wall, right? In that city, if you're, you're pointing towards the enemy and that enemy is attacking you, if you 180 and God has built that stronghold in the center, you're now pointing towards God, right? When you when you flee from sin, you point towards God, right? Yeah. So that is the most important thing. Then you run to the one who is going to protect you, that stronghold that he has built inside of your life, right? Yeah, the righteous run to it, right? Yeah. So I uh, think the last one was um, John. Uh, 1 John 4.4. 4, you are... From Elohim, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? Okay. So we know we're on the winning side, right? So that's the most important thing. We be obedient to the Father when he, you know, we repent, we forgive, we love. Those are the the, the, the things that God has required from us. It's not that difficult, <laughs> you know. You forgive, you love, you repent. Satan is the one that tells you it's difficult. Right? right. But the promises in the Bible tell us that all things can be done through he who is in us. Right. So right. that's that's pretty much what I had for that. I know we had some other things to talk about. And I took up all the time. Sorry. No, I don't, I don't <laughs> apologize. That's how it's supposed to go. You know, we were, you know, don't be sad. We didn't come. We didn't get the conspiracies trash in here. Oh, we because God was trying to work. <laughs> we got a couple of minutes. We can still talk about stuff. I, I just hope that that helped anybody who is dealing with things. I mean, when I was studying it out, I mean, it helped, it helped me because there's still things yeah. that I'm struggling with, you For know, sure. I'm, I'm walking through this just, just the same with you guys. And, and it was kind of like, God, my wife had asked me a question about this and I, and, and it was kind of like a flash that God showed me. And I started drawing up this whole thing with this like little castle and these walls and the enemy of these arrows. Yeah. It looked like, you know, football play, you know, playbook, yeah, where I'm yeah. like drawing the arrows in and then throwing them get kicked out. I was like, man, I really got to talk about this because yeah, I know the feeling it needs when you to be visualized, you know. Yeah. So, well, that's I wanted to since you brought that up too, like when you said you're in process, like we're all in process, okay? So we're not just because we're talking on here does not mean we know everything. We are not 100 on this. We're all learning. We're all going through. We hope that you guys just realize that we're just trying to be open. We share a lot of personal stories on here with you guys, not to sh like pretty much say do it like we did it you know what i mean but just so that you know like hopefully it, it resonates with somebody out there you know, whether it's live or later on in the archives because 
the testimony is is how you win, right? Your, the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony, that is, and not loving your lives unto death, um, that's how you win this war. And, and it's just, yeah, you're not 100. I'm not 100. Your bladder is not 100. That's why you have to roll like this every time. <laughs> oh, dudes, take these potty breaks all the time, man. But just so you know, like when you said your testimony was in process, like you're going to be in process. I, I can't tell you. Well, the first time I shared my testimony, every single time after that, I've added something else to it because it becomes like the new highlight, the next thing. Because I got to add this. I got to add that. You know, that's why it's hard to share the entire story with someone because it's still happening. It's happening every week. Something new is added. Some prayer is answered, you know? And I think this is a cool idea. I didn't plan on talking about this, but there's a book. Um, I'm sure you could probably get it uh, for free online. I got it for free online, the PDF version, but um, the War Scrolls. It's a Qumran scroll thing that they found. But in this, in this, in the the War Scrolls, uh, I'm talking about the War Scrolls. I don't know if you've ever read that the book. Uh, it's from the Qumran stuff, but oh yeah, yeah, I know. They said something about. super cool in there when I was reading through this, and it was talking about it's it's setting up for war, and it's God's instructions to the tribes for war, and He's telling each tribe to do certain things to set up or prepare. And he, he, the one he's like, you know, make a banner. He tells like this, whatever his particular tribe is, every tribe makes a banner that they hold up during the war. And each one says something specific according to what their mission is as a tribe. And God gives them the vision that there's the mission statement. He says, write this on the scroll, this, this, and this, and then write, um, uh, like it was a declaration statement along with it. And it would be like, we fight for God in his gracious love or whatever, loving kindness. And then they had all the names of their family on this, on this uh, banner. And you hold that up in the, when you're, when you're running into battle. And I was like, man, that is like the coolest idea ever, dude. Can you imagine like, instead of making the video of your testimony if you had a prayer journal or something like my i don't journal i started to a little bit but i can't ever keep up my wife prayer journals though and it's cool because we can go back and look like seven years ago and what she wrote in this prayer journal and you can see answers to prayer yeah for things that you're like i don't even remember praying for that but we that's happened you know like that he already did that and i don't remember ever praying for it Praise God, you know, but like, I don't write it down. So I never remember, but then I get heard <laughs> sometimes like, God, you're not answering my prayers. You, when you, if you were to write it down and you would like literally look at these things, you can, they're a banner of the testimony of uh, and the safety of Messiah, right? All these times that he's came to bat for you and, and you've won these battles, right? You haven't won the war. He won the war already, but you got to fight through these battles, and you need something sometimes to keep you going and to keep you. And, and I thought, we should make, we should somehow capitalize on this idea, man. Banners, <laughs> writing out your family's banner and putting it up on your wall, yeah. just like some people put the Shema on the doors and things like that. Uh, you put this on your wall, man. You know, like above your fireplace. Let it be known that God pr provides for us in financial areas or whatever. You know, like He is our healer. Whether your story, whatever your family story is, right? Wasn't there something? Wasn't there something tied to like uh, Moses' staff or something that they had etched out? I can't remember. I don't remember either. I don't know. But there was I mean, there was something I remember reading, and I can't remember if it was American Indian. I, I read too much, but there, there was something that generationally they had a staff that was passed down through each generation, and maybe that was the, some American Indians or something. I can't remember, but. They had this staff that they would etch out something that was important, like, you know, about the family and each generation, they passed it down to the next one. I mean, that'd be yeah. cool to have a banner or to do something like that. So instead of passing yeah. generational curses, pass generational blessings like that. Absolutely. That's yeah. Be doing. Give them these. Yeah. Pass these things to your kids. Like this is our family line of, you know, any, I mean, these things are going to have to be massive. These are, you know how like your grandma quilts, yeah. like I made a quilt for you, honey. And you're like, holy cow, this is like really detailed. 
and then your sister gets one or your brother gets one. It's like not as detailed. You're like, what's up with this? Like, how come you spent so much time making theirs? And then mine's kind of like crappy, you know, but like, you know, what if we did this with uh, banners, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. We've made these banners and we're like, dude, this is your story, son. Pass this along to your kids, you know, hang this over your fireplace. Yeah. And then, you know, when you get married, make your own. You know what I mean? Like do these things that start these traditions. I think this is this is something that we should do, man. Like, yeah. you know, in, in war times, I mean, they would pass weapons like knives or or, you know, the bow or whatever. Like the father would pass the bow to the son when he became a man. It's like, you know, things like that. I think we should we should come up with things like this. I mean, I know it's modern day, but I, I'll still give my son a knife. Yeah, I've got a I've got a I've got a staff that my Sweet dad ivory. Yeah, that was like a walking stick that you know I thought about like oh you know I should start you know we'll put something on there for my dad because he's gone now. Then I'll put something and then I'll pass that on to my you know my son and you know when yeah. God does something pivotal in his life. You know he'll he can etch something in there or whatever you know and then right. pass it on to his kid. So, yeah, I think that's awesome. I think we should try to figure that out because I think it's important. And I got to go to work in three hours, dude. <laughs> I love you guys, but maybe we'll have to do like a, if we get some time this weekend, maybe we'll do like a impromptu daytime show. Like, yeah, we'll do <laughs> we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll do a conspiracy because yeah. we haven't we haven't really talked conspiracy, and I know I mean like there's a lot of stuff to talk about going on right now, especially with this just being the first month of January, there's so much that has happened in this, in this month already. Like, I mean, well, just take everything that you heard today and apply it to this. All this crap in the mainstream news is fear porn. Yeah. yeah this, whenever we said porn, say fear porn instead, <laughs> and then you'll be good because that's exactly what this is. I mean, these viruses and these, uh, you know, rumors of wars and earthquakes and, you know, this Wait, stuff, I had this conversation with my mom about all this kind of stuff. And I go find me in the Bible where it says we should be fearful of any of this stuff. Yeah. Right. We, the dude, Bible we tells us, the Bible tells us all this stuff is going to happen. Yeah. There's gonna be wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, all kinds of things, but it doesn't ever say be, be, you know, afraid of it. Right. It, yeah, he, don't, I think if up. anything, if anything, dude, so we've already won and it's appointed unto man wants to die. Right. Everyone dies. We're all going to die, bro. I'm pretty sure that I prayed. And God told me, you will die for me one day. I know that. I feel it. I feel comfortable knowing that. Sometimes I get carried away and try to think like, I hope I don't die like in some kind of really crazy way. And I don't want to like go through all that. But you know what I mean? You can get it. But I know that I will give my life for my savior, you know, yep. and this is a war and you got to go into war prepared to die. You know, yep. you, that's how you win. You literally you can't save anybody. You can't do this stuff. You can't be effective if you're not willing to sacrifice. So that was, that was something I saw a long time ago was like, I, I made, I made a, basically I told my myself that I needed to prepare myself. Like, cause I didn't know what was going to, I, I was, I've been huge in eschatology. I understand revelations. I understand like all of the end time stuff. I've, I've been very fervent in my study on it. Right. I understand that I like, I told myself I need to, if it comes down to it and I, my, I'm, my head's on the chopping block, I am not going to turn away from God, no matter what else. Right. If I'm going to believe that this stuff is true, then I am going to believe unto death that it's the truth. Right. And if, and, and I gave myself to God and said, look, if this is what it takes, I'm, I'm going to go there. It made it a lot harder when I had a family. Let me tell you I, something right now. People are, you know, you get scared when you think like when you just sit around and think about uh, all the evil that's coming upon the earth, right? And it's kind of paralyzing a little bit because you're like, man, we're, we're there. We're right there. But then you kind of like just think, well, times are short. I better tell people. But yeah. that's not what he tells you. He tells you to be ready. And in Matthew 24, 44, he says, be ready because the son of man comes back at, at a time when no one's ready for it, where no one knows, right? So you need to be ready. Well, what does the scripture say about being ready? It says you should be evangelizing, winning souls. The harvest is ripe and the workers right. are few. You be doing something, not just talking and posting memes about earthquakes and gematria and, and you know, Kobe Bryant dying in an Illuminati ritual. That stuff might be true, but 
it's not the focus. You know what I mean? Like by the king and, and yeah, it doesn't. It does, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this too because I posted a meme about it too, but and it was for selfish reasons when I did it. I, I was trying to make a point, and it whether the timing was right, whatever. But uh, I, I preach against this meme things because literally memeing does nothing for anybody and i still do it sometimes and then i'm like oh man so i pulled it down because i'm like i just memed and i don't you know what i mean like i it, i didn't meme to meme but i mean you know what i'm saying just kidding i try to make it funnier but oh uh, anyways i i just think like we have to take this this war that we keep talking about that we keep tre- trying to teach you guys to prepare for we need to take it to them because we need to not only be on the offense but we need to rescue people, right? That's what this whole push to resist and rescue is all about. Resist the devil and rescue the lost. Yeah. Set the captives free. Bring freedom, man. You have the authority. You bring freedom. You bring a rescue. You are the only one that can rescue, you know? Um, so I think when you see, when you start to begin to look at the end times or the times that we're living in from those perspectives, like my time's running out, I might, not be able to save all my friends you know like that should hurt you 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 should feel that like gosh there's so many people that i love that i want to get to and if we're really at this time then that we don't have a lot of time i don't have any time to waste you know like i think sometimes we we get too busy thinking about tomorrow like we said we put it off till tomorrow right yeah but tomorrow never comes man there's several several of the major and minor prophets, man. They lamented so hard for the for the people that they were sent there to tell them, like they were warning them, destruction's coming. Destru- you know, I don't want to see these people, you know, die. They were lamenting for that. Like they it was it was heartbreaking to them. And we need to be like kind of that same spirit. Like that's that's the problem with this world. It is it's so overwhelming, and they constantly bombarding us in our media, our advertisement, all this other stuff. You're so wrapped up in the world that. You, when do you have time to think about that stuff? Like that's where we need to get our brain focused on. We need to. Yeah. Really- if you have stuff going on that you can't think about this stuff, you have too much in your life, and you need to eliminate it. Yeah. You need to get these this football out of your life. You need to get that out of your life. You know, if there's something that like football consumed my mind, and it wasn't a bad thing. I, it's not evil to like football. It just became an idol. Right. Just like you know, you look at the you know Kobe Bryant dies, and yeah, he might have been like super cool and. He did a lot of things. If you like basketball, he was probably awesome to watch, you know, and all that stuff. But then he dies and people are mourning him and they're putting like, they're, they're, it's like idol worship. You yeah. know, this is veneration of your gods yeah. right now, what you're doing with Kobe Bryant. You well, know what I mean? Yeah. It's, I mean, that's craziness. It's yeah. And then there's so many other things um, that we, that we should be concerned about. Yes. I mean, it's sad. It's sad that somebody, it is sad. Away, but there was somebody, uh, pastor that I follow posted up something that said there were 115,000 abortions that happened. That's yeah. what, that was me. I posted. Yeah. And then everybody blasted me like too soon, <laughs> man, too soon. And I'm like, dude, that the whole point is not, I don't, it's not that I hate Kobe Bryant or I, I'm not sad about this, or I believe he's Illuminati. So he deserved it. It's that at what it's ironic how much we value life, you know, or, or like in certain situations, but we don't in others, you know what I mean? Uh, that was my main point. And like, I guess, you know, like I always preach to you guys, memes don't do any good yet. I memed <laughs> thinking it would do good. And of course it did not do any good. So no, I said, yeah. nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, Sometimes you see it and you're like, Oh, I'm going to meme that that's perfect. Uh, and then you're like, oh. I guess when you're, you know, when you become a flat earther, you start posting flat earth stuff and you're like, <laughs> how can you even believe the world's a globe? post and then you get five thousand messages of you're a moron and then you're like i should have never posted this <laughs> you don't know, change your mind you still believe what you believe you should have never told anybody the shame that comes with that <laughs> no I, I just yeah it's just uh yeah there's a lot there's a lot going on right now and and you can you can spend all your time focusing on what the world is trying to tell you to focus on it's it's sleight of hand they always are, hey, come look at this hand while they're doing something in the other hand. I mean, it's it's just what magic is, right? Magic with a C. It's magic with a K. It's deception, right? Yeah. It's it's manipulation. It's look at this while I'm doing Magic with this. a K. The K stands for, well, the, it, it, the K is the 11th letter. 
the 11 in magic, right? The 11 in the Kabbalah is the, yeah. the headstone. And, and also, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law is 11 syllables, 11 words. Right. The 11, 11. The two pillars. The two pillars. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, also, <laughs> the, infinity, the infinity logo. Yeah, the eleven eleven gateway, the infinity logo in Scientology. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> this is all. This is all. Yeah, it's all but this. like I said, I mean, we can concentrate on all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know how many times I've talked to people and I've been like, you know, when was the last time you read the Bible? And they said, well, you know, I don't, I don't have time to do this. I'm telling you right now, if you're a Christian and you say you don't have time for God, there's a passage in the Bible where there's five virgins who are not prepared, and when they came to the door. Jesus said, I don't have time for you. Yeah. Right. So it, it, if you don't have time for Jesus, you don't have time for Bible study and a relationship with God. Don't be surprised when, when everything happens or you die tomorrow or whatever, and you go to stand before the throne room of God and he goes, turn away from me. I don't know you. Right. So because you didn't spend time getting to know him, he's going to say, Hey, I don't know you. Right. That's, that's, that's pretty plain and simple. So literally that's the only thing that I would say, like, if you, you want to help with your strongholds in your life, get to know your father, right? Love him. The Learn best about way, him. The best just like you do, that. just like you do your wife, right? Or your husband, you get to know him. You love them on another level that no one knows them. No one loves them. Like you do. You always think the best, you know, of them. You, you know what I'm saying? Like when someone were to like, for example, if I love my wife and someone comes to me and says, your wife did this, this, and this, I'm going to be like, no, she didn't. You know, I know my wife. She wouldn't do that. She yeah. does not. That's how we're supposed to be. Cause when the world comes to us and says, this is fine for you to do this, this is okay. It's not hurting anything. You're like, no, it is hurting something, you know, because I know well, what's, my what's dad doesn't like that. He says in the scripture, which I know because I'm reading it because this is what he likes. Yeah. Right. And I know now that he doesn't like that. He would never say that. He would never ask me to do that. This is, right. I'm going to rebuke this. This is the devil. I'm going to resist this. That's what's scary you about know? the Antichrist. This is the anti, the anti Christos will be a Christ impersonator. And it's going to, it's just like Satan to do 90% truth and 10% lies. The Bible says, my sheep know my voice, right? right? If you know and study scripture, you know what the end times say, you know what, Isaiah, what Ezekiel, what Revelations, what John talks about. If you know what those scriptures say, you're going to be aware of what's happening when it's happening. The rest of the people, whatever deception they choose to use, whether it be giant mile wide spaceships in the sky or, you know, a fake Jesus appears and starts, you know, walking on water and doing whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, a Mahadi comes, whatever, and you got the Jews and the Arabs and everybody's worshiping this Messiah. Whatever the deception is going to be, you're going to know because you studied the Bible, you spent time with the shepherd, and you know the voice of Yahweh, you are going to know the deception. It says there's a great falling away. That means they were at one point in time not falling away, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a great falling away. There will also be a time of redemption for a lot of people who are persecutors, right? Mm -hmm. If you look, Christianity always thrives under persecution. The end times is going to be a reversal. All of the people who are pew sitting Christians who are taught rapture and all this and that, when, pardon my French, the shit hits the fan, those people are going to go, where was the rapture? If the rapture wasn't real, then God's not real. My pastor lied to me and they're going to fall away. There's going to be a lot of theological ideas that are not. Well, if they have a fake rapture and they're not included. Yeah. I mean, then they're going to think, well, I just been living a lie that obviously that wasn't real because I or I got left here so I've lost something I didn't think about it the right you know what I mean but the yeah the other thing is too you have to believe that things are not getting better okay we we tend to think that they're not as bad as they were back in the day we saw them with more and all these different places right because God hasn't destroyed anything with fire yet he does later but maybe it's not that bad yet right but you have to remember that evil is ramping up continually and then when you get to the revelation 19 19 and the red horse prophecy it's the pentecost of the demonic realm yeah. this evil realm is that is the height the pinnacle point they're looking for that that we've had ours right we already had ours they have not had theirs they are moving that direction 
Yeah. The when, Satan, when Satan ramps up, when he knows yes. his time is when he knows he's running out of time, he is going to ramp up. And if you can't fight today, you're never going to fight. You're not going to last. You will be dead. Right. No, and it's we're okay. talking, today we talked about the eternal struggle. Right. If you can't get in the mind frame that there's an eternal war going on inside of you with spiritual manifestations, oppressions, things like that, you are not going to be ready for an outside war. Right. Because if you can't handle the internal struggle, the outside struggle is going to be. I mean, it says men's hearts will fail them. Right. So if you don't have the understanding, you know, like I said, what I was just talking about, you know, coming to the confrontation with myself saying, will I die for what I believe? Right. And I have agreed and said in my in my spirit, no matter what happens, no matter what's going to happen, you know, they could take my family and all kinds of stuff. I am not going to turn my back on the Messiah that's been through there for me for my entire life. Right. I will, I, you know, I'll kiss my kid, my wife on the head and say, I'll see you on the other side. And they're going to have to cut my head off. Right. When you come to that understanding that you're willing to die for what you believe, what the enemy has no strength for anything else. You know, right? it's even you're harder to die. You, for, you, you, you try to live. That's what the thing right. is. When you come to terms with you will die for it. Then I'll it becomes now you have to live like you would die for it, <laughs> right? You know, that's, you're not. See, I think a lot of people have misjudged. They think that because you know they've seen these rapture movies or they've seen, you know, they've heard these other things. These people, these eschatology things, like you're going to get some kind of moment where you have to make a choice between dying for your faith and not. When they when it says, "Are you a Christian?" You might not even make it that far. You know what I mean? Yeah. You might have no warning at all. It's not like you're going to get that redemption moment where they ask you a yes or no, true or false question, and you just have to say yes or no. You know, you might not get there. Your life is an example of whether you chose yes or no. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, that's, that's the thing, too, that I want everybody to be cognizant of is every generation of Christians for the last 2000 years has thought their generation was the end. Right. And we live in a, in a such a complacent. It was even happening back in, in, in Jesus's time where people were lukewarm. Right. They he said, I would rather you be hot or cold. Right. But, you know, you're not you're, you're lukewarm and I want to spit you out of my mouth. Right. The thing is, we are waiting for the signs and see, you know, these, these things. Well, so have previous generations. How much did they not do? Because what does he say? He says a wicked generation seeks a sign. Right. Or, uh, you know, we don't know when our time is up. Right. We, we might be we might live till we're 80. We might only live the next couple of years that the rapture or not the rapture, but the end, the end times may kick off in 10 years, 20 years tomorrow, 100 years from now. We don't know God's Bible and his clock. Right. Jesus himself said no man will know the day nor the time. Right. But we will know by seasons. But we're not there yet. Right. The, the problem is, is we can't live like we're waiting on the on on the end of the world and say, well, you know, well, when it all happens, then I'll change. Then I'll be a good Christian. No, that's not how it works, because there is no guarantee we're going to make it there. We need to live a life that reflects that that idea that, yeah, I would die for my belief. But we need to live like yeah. we, we believe that. Right. That's the. That's what God is asking of us. Not that he doesn't want any of us. There's to a country from. song that says it perfect. Live like we were dying. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, just think about I'm going to sing it right now. <laughs> well, cause it's really, it's really important because think about if you were given 24 hours, right. From this point, if, if, if you knew that in 24 hours you were going to die, what would you do with your life? Yeah. Think about that every single day. Would you spend more time with your family? Would you tell people that you love them? Mm -hmm. Would you go out and try to help people, right? Because we are we are in a perpetual cycle of being one heartbeat away from dying, right? We only have 24 hours. That's all we get. There is no tomorrow, and yesterday's gone, right? Yep. So we need, to start living, God is now. we need to start living as Christians like we only have 24 hours left. Yep. That's all I can say. <laughs> all right, guys. We got to cut this off because I'm about to walk away. It's all been fun, but... I have to function. I know, yeah. I got a big day tomorrow. We got online freedom group starting tomorrow night. Yeah. I got you can't. I can't be. I pray you get some rest tonight, buddy. I'm not getting rest tonight, man. <laughs> no rest. I'm gonna literally go, like, lay down, and then it's like this is what it looks like when I go to sleep on Wednesday nights. <laughs> It's like it's over. 
three hours is gone. And I'm like, that's how, oh, it's, that's how it's been for me the last few <laughs> months with my daughter. Like as soon as you fall asleep, she's waking up. Yeah. Somebody so. kicks you in the head and you're like, you know, <laughs> why are all my kids? <laughs> dad, 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 dad. Yeah. Yeah. Smack oh, in the face. Man. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> we just got over a sickness too. So everybody was oh, sick man. at our house. And so they were kind of like crowding us in the bed. Everybody, cause you know, once you're tired and somebody wakes up and you're like, just come and just lay down, shut up, lay down, you know, like, everybody get in here and just shut up so we can sleep for five more minutes. Hey, well, we love, we love each and every one of you guys. Thanks for joining tonight. And thanks for everybody who was in the chat and who commented. Don't forget, like, and share, you know, host it, let everybody yeah. know what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Keep us motivated. And uh, hopefully these these tools were as powerful as they were for me because I'm going to be implying or implore, well, implementing these into my life just as much as I, I I hope that you guys do. So, but we love each and every one of you guys. Ian, yes, we do. I will talk to you tomorrow, buddy. All right, bro. All right, love everybody. See you, man. Peace out.